All right, hello, 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 and welcome. Welcome once again. Hold on, let me scoot in a little more. Welcome once more to the Shark Stream Book Club. It's me. It's Gage. Your 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 host with the most. The most what? You may ask. Hey, don't worry about it. Just, just look. Just don't worry. Just I have the most. Okay. That's, that's what you should focus on. I have the most, and that's what matters. Do you, do you, un, do you understand? I should hope so. Anyways. Today, we are going to be reading Dishonored, the Corroded Man. Uh, Dishonored, the Corroded Man is the first novel written for... The Dishonored series. Um, and uh, I haven't. So unlike um, stuff like the the Alan Wake novelization, um, uh, the Alan Wake Files, and Dead Space Martyr, and much in the vein of Dark Siders the Abomination. Well, actually, not even in the vein of Dark Siders the Abomination Vault, because I listened to a bunch of the audiobook of Dark Siders the Abomination Vault before I ever ended up reading it for the book club. So, unlike literally everything we've read before, um, this is going to be the first one that I haven't looked at, period. You know? So that's. I'm kind of excited about that, if I'm being honest. You know? It's it's entirely uh, uncharted territory, but it's not uncharted. It's dishonored. Uncharted is a different series. <laughs> okay, that's bad joke. Bad joke. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to go ahead and dive into this um, because I've you know I've talked about this before. Dishonored is one of my absolute favorite game series like ever you know like i didn't really expect to like be one of those people that like really likes the idea of the immersive sim but like you know in hindsight i probably should have expected that i'm i i guess i guess i'm just that bitch you know um, but Dishonored is definitely, like, up there in terms of just, like, you know, just based on its style, its its lore, its story, just everything is so fucking cool. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm, I'm never one to... I'm never one to turn down or turn my nose up, up or down, whichever. Hello, G-Man. Um, at getting more story out of things I like. Like, I'm the kind of person that just, like, hears that there's a sequel to something coming out, just like, oh, I can't wait to see that sequel. I'm excited to see this sequel. Because I like... I like having more of things I like. Now, um, the story of Dishonored in terms of, like, you know, sort of like the mainline stuff ended after three games. Uh, technically speaking, Deathloop is part of it because Deathloop takes place in the world of Dishonored, just far in the future. Um, but like the actual stories regarding like the Outsider, regarding Corvo, regarding Emily, all sort of ended with Billy Lurk's story in uh, Dishonored: Death of the Outsider. Um. So, you know, it's it's easy to look at that and be like, okay, here is this complete tale about this world, about, you know, these people whose lives have been affected by, like, treachery and intrigue and um, all-powerful forces beyond even their most basic understanding. And in the end, it's like, 
you know, you go through all that and you, you know, at the end of it, you feel pretty good about it. Um, but me, I like having more. So it is actually really cool to me that there is so many more, there are so many more stories, um, just kind of available to tell within the Dishonored universe. Um, so today we are going to be reading the first of those stories, which, as I said, is Dishonored the Corroded Man. Um, taking a look at the back here. Uh, Empress Emily Caldwin leads a dual life, fulfilling her duties as Empress while training with her father, Corvo Atano, mastering the arts of stealth, combat, and assassination. The Corroded Man. A strange, shrouded figure appears in Dunwall, seeming to possess powers once wielded by the assassin known as Dowd. Faced with the possibility that their deadliest foe has returned, Emily and Corvo plunge headlong into a life-and-death race against time. If they fail to learn the truth about this mysterious enemy, the result could be destruction on an unimaginable scale. First original novel based on the hugely popular video game, Dishonored. So, you know, that's what we're working with. Um, now, one thing that some... <laughs> I really like the uh, options that you have for, like, how you can play through Dishonored, how you can do certain um, events, and how those things kind of affect the world around you. Um, one of, I guess, the downsides of, like, you know, making sequels or making additional mate story material for that is the fact that you need to commit to something, you know? You need to you you need to look at what happens at the end of this story that has multiple endings, multiple routes you could take, multiple events that could that may or may not have happened. And you need to say, okay, what definitely happened and what definitely didn't happen? Because I mean we can't all be Deus Ex the Invisible War where we just say, oh yeah, everything fucking happened. <laughs> Some of us gotta commit to something. And Dishonored commits. Um, I'm not saying that every single decision on the low chaos end of the spectrum was taken by Corvo Atano within the cons within the canon events of Dishonored 1. But generally speaking, he made good decisions so as to limit the amount of bloodshed caused. Uh, much like we did. Um, but as we go through this, we are uh, likely going to be um, noticing, like, oh, this is where he did this, this is how he did this. And right away, just based on that description, we know he didn't kill Dowd. Well, supposedly. Probably not. Like, they could look at this and be like, oh, could Doubt have returned? It's just, like, from being stabbed in the neck? Probably not. But, like, if Corvo perhaps spared his life, then yeah, I mean, maybe. He could have returned from having his life spared. People do that all the time. Because you don't actually go anywhere when your life is spared. You just kind of hang out. And you're just like, well, what do I do now? Now that I have been given the second lease on life, how do I spend it? And the answer isn't always a good one. Some people fuck it up. <laughs> but some people don't. And that's the plot of the film Nobody. Starring Bob Odenkirk, which I highly recommend checking out. It's pretty good. Anyway, <laughs> we're not here to talk about Nobody starring Bob Odenkirk. We're here to talk about Dishonored the Corroded Man. Let me just tell you... Oh, that smells like a book. <laughs> oh, that smells like a book. All right. Let's get in there, shall we? Prologue. Somewhere near Uturka. Month undetermined. 1849 to 1850. Contrast with the prisons of Tivia, located in the tundra at the center of that nation-state... Oh, hold up. Let me try again. Contrast this with the prisons of Tivia, located in the tundra at the center of that nation-state. 
At some of the labor camps in Tivia, there are literally no walls. A prisoner exhausted from hard labor and without tools is unlikely to survive the harsh climate or the hungry packs of hounds that rove the frozen... Wastes. Wastes was the word. In fact, Tivian prison authorities make it known that any prisoner is free to leave at any time. In all of recorded history, no one has made the remote walk across the snow and ice to the nearest city. Prisons of the Isles, extract from a report commissioned by the Royal Spymaster. The prisoner stopped at the edge of the precipice and gazed out over the land ahead, the trailing edge of his heavy black woolen greatcoat flapping in the stiff wind that screamed out of the glacier valley in front of him. The gale was so loud he could barely think, let alone contemplate the complexity of the task ahead. There was no time to dally, no time to waste. There was work to be done. He had come this far, too far to fail, too far to give up, but at the same time not far enough, too close to his captors, to his tormentors. He knew he had to keep going, and he knew that there was nobody in the world who could stop him except himself. The prisoner adjusted his black traveler's hat pulling the wide brim down tight over his face to stop it cartwheeling away in the wind, and he looked out at what lay before him. This was the howling wind and the snowy waste that the cold sun had burned with a flat, dead light. This was the tundra. This was Tivia. The prisoner turned, letting the chains he carried over one shoulder slip off into the snow. At the, under the, at the other end of the chains was a bundle of black cloth, curled into itself, shaking in the snow. If the shivering thing was whimpering or crying or begging for forgiveness, the prisoner couldn't hear it over the wind. This thing had once been a guard at Uturka, the labor camp. Now the prisoner's own captive, he was numb. Numb from the cold, numb from the journey, numb from the knowledge that his story was coming to an end and that soon he would be one with the void. Because the guard had not been a good man, and he knew it, he knew, also, the fate that would befall his untethered self once the prisoner had finished his cruel business in the hard snows. His end would come soon, but not yet. The prisoner still had need for him. He hefted the chains in his gloved hand, twisting, pulling, just a little. The shivering wreck rose to his knees, but no further, and shuffled forward but remained bowed, his head buried in a dozen orbits of his scarf, the huge collar of his black greatcoat upturned. It was the same kind the Prisoner War, the standard issue of the Tibian military, designed for unpopular tours in the harsh, icebound interior of the country. By the way, if I'm, like, quiet or anything, please let me know. I've been trying to, like, futz with my microphone to, like, make myself come through better. Without, I ideally without having to, like, worry about, um, uh, blowing out the microphone itself. The prisoner had taken his coat from another guard at the camp, one of three captives and the first to die. There in the camp, before they had even walked out into the snowy plain, the second had died two days into the trek, and the prisoner still had that captive's chain bound around his waist, the thick steel collar now hanging from his belt. The prisoner had needed three men, so he had taken three. The first for his clothes, the heavy winter uniform of the Tivian army supplementing the ragged wardrobe the prisoner had worn for years and years without ever taking off. Now he wore the fur-lined greatcoat, the hat with the wide brim to shade from the glare of the dead winter sun, the scarf woven from the pelt of the tundra's saber-toothed black bear. And over his eyes, the first guard's snow goggles, two discs of polished red glass nearly as big as the saucers off which the guards at the camp sipped their hot, imported gristal tea. That first guard was dead. It had been necessary. He hadn't wanted to surrender his uniform, so the prisoner had taken it by force. It was of no consequence. There was no one else alive at the camp for the man to guard. Not anymore. As the prisoner had picked over the dead guard's clothing, the other two he had captured, chained at the neck, shackled like the pigs they were, had knelt on the hard ground and watched in silence, their minds spinning over distant horizons as their new master got dressed for the long journey ahead. Then the prisoner had yanked the chains and led his two captives away, their heads bowed, their lips moving as they murmured deliriously, stumbling through the snow behind him. The second guard had been taken for another purpose altogether. Food. Not food for the prisoner, nor for the third captive, but for the wolves the prisoner knew would be tracking them as soon as they left the safety and light of the camp's outer perimeter. After crossing that boundary, they had walked for two days, though through snow that was sometimes hard-packed, other times waist-deep. The going was slow. The wolves were fast. In the hard winter, in the months of darkness, of high cold, of ice, 
This was their world, their domain. And outside of the Tivian prisons that dotted the frozen plains, man was a trespasser. Though, for the wildlife, not an unwelcome one. On the contrary, those trying to escape, the fools who thought they could make it, who took the mocking invitations of the guards to just walk out, were most welcome indeed. Food was scarce, and in this frozen world, the wolf packs were hungry. In the trek from the camp, the prisoner found evidence of plenty of previous flights of freedom. Such dreams, such attempts, were all the same. Ill-conceived, desperate, impossible. Because the prisons of Tivia were all the same, each was a labor camp in the wilderness, in the tundra. They varied in size, ranging from small camps of a few dozen convicts to prisons that were more like small towns. They varied in function, too. Those convicted of lesser offenses were doomed to nothing more than the harvest of lumber, a still task that would break most men, for the wood of the forest was as solid as Dunwall granite. The trees themselves were petrified by the cold, becoming nothing but tall, vertical shafts of permafrost. But the lumber camps were not penitentiaries, not in the mind of the prisoner. They were something far lesser, merely correctional facilities. The inhabitants of which might even one day return to the warmth of civilization, albeit as shadows, as ghosts of their former selves, their fight, their rebellion, worked out of them. The other prisons were different. Quarries for rock-breaking, or as at Uturka, mines sunk deep into the tundra where salt was wrested from an impenetrable frozen darkness in the earth. To be sentenced to those camps was to disappear. Death would be preferable, but there was no such statute in the Tivian law books. Indeed, to be sent to prison wasn't even considered a punishment. According to the twisted logic of the high judges, the quasi-military tribunal who ru ruled over the isle with an iron fist. To be sent to the camps was, in their words, to be granted freedom. Because the prisoners, because the prisons, had no walls. They had guards, certainly. The prisoner pitied the poor bastards who were themselves sentenced to long tours out in the frozen wastes, but at least the guards could go home again when their time was up. The guards were there to run the camps, to keep order, to keep the work going, to punish those who did not fulfill their quotas. Whether it was lumber or salt or broken rock, but they were not there to prevent escape. Hello, Ion Agenda. Escape, the high judges said, was impossible because the camps were not prisons. There were no walls, no gates, no fences. The quote-unquote prisoners were not shackled or manacled or locked in at night or in the day. In fact, the prisoners were free to leave. Everyone in the camp was a free man, pardoned by the state, permitted with full authority to return home to their families and their towns and their villages and their causes. Of course, escape was impossible. The prisoners knew it, the guards knew it, the high judges knew it, but their hands were clean, their consciences clear. Because every man was a free man. The prisoner and his two remaining captives came across the first body just a mile from the lights of the camp. Half of it was missing. It lay face down in the snow, arms outstretched, the thin cloth covering the black torn, or cloth covering the back torn wide open, exposing perfect, unmarked flesh as white as morally alabaster, and just as hard, frozen forever. What had become of the lower half of the man could not be known. This close to the camp, the would-be escapee would have died of the cold rather than been killed by wolves. Although the winter had been particularly bad, it was possible the legs had been taken by a desperate animal venturing closer to human habitation than it, normally, than it would normally risk, probably scared off by the lights and the guards before it could do more than gnaw off of the lower limbs. The cold had preserved the rest of the body perfectly. He could have been lying there a day, he could have been lying there fifty winters. The body was just the first. Indeed, it was said from the top of Uterka's North Tower, on a clear day you could see frozen cadavers living, lying even closer to the camp than this one. But the prisoner had never climbed the North Tower to see. Now there wasn't a tower to climb. Not anymore. Soon after they found the second body, or soon after they found the second body, then a third, then more. For a time, the prisoner and his two chain companions followed a virtual trail of corpses, each as cold as ice, each looking as though the walker had just lain down for a while in the snow and had not gotten up again. Some were intact, others were just parts. At the end of the second day, the prisoner slaughtered the second captive and butchered the body with a knife that had a golden hilt and a wicked double blade. As he did so, the last surviving captive sat in the snow at the end of his chain and watched with glazed eyes, such was the magic that held him. Then the prisoner laid out the red meat and wet bones for the wolves. It didn't look like much, spread out in snow, stained crimson under the cold sun, and the bones were a waste, but it would be enough. Free from the threat of wolves, he and his last captive would have time to reach the Glacier Valley, to reach his escape. 
The prisoner examined the first three frozen bodies, just to be sure in his own mind they weren't suitable. While he had expected to find the frozen cadavers, he hadn't expected that any of them would fit his needs. His examinations confirmed this. The flesh was hard, though pliable under his twin-bladed knife, but the bones beneath were unusable, the matrix of ice crystals within disrupting any reservoirs of power they may have once had. Useless. What he needed was the bones of a man. Living bones from a living man. To escape the tundra, to return to the world, he required a very particular sort of magic. This is why he had brought the third captive. The second had been brought for his flesh, the third had been brought for his bones. The prisoner looked out at the glacier before him. The precipice on which he stood was a sheer drop of a thousand feet or more. The cliff face, a shocking black scar of bedrock and what had been, so far, an uninterrupted wasteland of blinding white, ground and sky alike, the horizon merely a dirty gray smudge that flickered and moved in the corner of his eyes. Beyond the precipice was a deep, wide valley, the floor hard-packed snow, the walls a jagged jigsaw of giant blocks of ice, their sides vertical in a deep, translucent blue, as if the glacial crags were made not of ice, but of sapphire. It was, some said, one of the wonders of the world, a landscape of untold beauty. The ice field had been explored and illustrated for hundreds of years, but even the engravings that could be found within the precise geographical tomes housed at the Academy of Natural Philosophy in Dunwall could never do justice to the sheer, breathtaking majesty of the landscape. The landscape that was the key. His first scarf pulled high, the wind tugging at the wide rim of his hat, the prisoner turned his red-glassed eyes from the valley to his last captive, bundled behind him in the snow. The wreck of a man lifted his head. Maybe he could sense that the moment was now, even as his addled mind swam in a sea of confusion, of madness. Another effect of the prisoner's magic, the magic that allowed him to walk out of the camp, that would allow him to walk out of the tundra, to walk back to the world, to civilization, to revenge. As the last captive stared at his own reflection in his master's snow goggles, he moved his mouth as if to say something, but no words came out. Kneeling in the snow, the captive, the former camp guard, swayed from side to side as if held in the thrall of his own distorted image. But his eyes were unfocused, his pupils small, the bare skin of his face worn red raw by the cold and by the wind that screamed and howled and screamed again. Behind his scarf, the prisoner smiled. The magic, the aura, was holding. His escape was near. With his free hand, the one not wrapped in the end of the chain leash, he reached across his body, sliding his gloved hand beneath the heavy flap of his greatcoat. Even before he touched the knife, he could feel the warmth radiating from the twin blades. Indeed, he thought, perhaps the greatcoat, the hat, the scarf, perhaps they were all unnecessary. Perhaps he hadn't needed to kill that guard just to take his clothes. No matter. And besides, he had enjoyed the first guard's death. There was a satisfaction there, a small one but a satisfaction nonetheless. Perhaps because it was the first tiny sliver of revenge, the first act of war against his oppressors, the first death of many more to come. The prisoner pulled the knife from his belt, and immediately the swooning captive's eyes found the blades and focused keenly on them, watching as they shone with a golden light, taking the cold light of the sun and spitting it back as something else entirety, entirely. excuse me, An electricity that sparked behind the eyelids, the reflection of a fire, of a great burning that ended one world and started another, uncountable years ago. The knife was warm in the prisoner's hand, and that warmth spread up his arm, through his body. It felt as if it would as if he was sinking into one of his of the rare natural volcanic springs that periodically interrupted the tundra, the springs that provided the camps with their heat and their power. Then he lifted the golden knife, placing the tip of the twin blades in the hollow of the captive's throat. The people of Tivia, thank you for your service, he said. The captive looked at him, all understanding absent from his glazed eyes, and then the prisoner pu pushed and from white snow, er, excuse me, and the white snow was stained with something hot and red. Alright, so, Rolog. Now, Let's go ahead and get our notes up here real quick. One moment. So our story starts out in Tivia. Tivia. 
Tivia is basically Dishonored's Russia. It is the land from which the scientist Anton Sokolov hails. Um, he was a major character in the second game, and we'll be seeing him again in the second, or in the first game, he was a major character. And we'll be seeing him again in the second one. Um, basically, you know, it's, it's kind of like Siberia, you know, the frozen tundras, glaciers, things like that. Um, and, you know, we get a few sort of... glimpses into the kind of place it is. Uh, it is evidently a militaristic land. And it is ruled by essentially a council of judges who, you know, make the decisions. Now, it should be noted that when I say ruled, I mean like it's a it's a it's a nation state. It's all part of like the empire uh, ruled over by uh, the empress. Uh, in this case, um, Empress Emily Caldwin, since she was placed on the throne at the end of the first game. Um. Now, something about this concept of, like, prison with no walls. Where have I heard that before? Oh, God, right. I know where I've heard that before. And it's not a good place to have heard it before. A, a particular young adult fantasy series written by a, quite frankly, absurd transphobic bigot. Um, is where I have heard the concept of a prison with no walls, where, like, conceivably you're free to go if you can fucking make it. Um, but it's, it's kind of like this sort of, like, Catch-22, where it's just like, oh yeah, we're going to absolve you of all your crimes, but you have to go, uh, to this work camp where... You're more likely to die if if you decide to uh, try and like leave. Okay. Hold on. So it's kind of like this philosophical catch-22, where it's just like, oh yeah, you know, we don't have any prisoners, everyone is completely absolved of their crimes, you're totally free to go if you want. If you leave, you're probably going to die. We're not going to kill you. No, no, why would we? We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't kill you. But if you try to leave, you're going to either freeze to death or get eaten by wolves. So, but I mean, you can leave. You can leave if you want to. So, it, it's it feels like one of those decisions made at like some higher level to basically like absolve them of all responsibility for what might happen to these people. Where it's just like, I mean, you know, if they feel like they can make it, they can go. We're not gonna we're not gonna stop them. You know. But hey, this guy did it, you know? Um, it seems like he had a lot of planning. There's there's mention of how the prison just simply isn't there anymore. Like, it, from the sound of it, it sounds like various destruction...
the soundtrack that I have running in the background caught me off guard. You know, anytime I choose one of these, I just kind of hope that it's, you know, just the instrumental stuff. And not, like, vocal tracks. And then, like, they throw something like that at me. Goodness. I hope how loud that is in my ear isn't translating. It's not like super loud or anything in my ear, but like I do hope. Oh, this is still Drunken Whaler. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I'm just hoping like it doesn't like drown me out or anything like with how it's set up on the stream. Um, but yeah, ev so. We're not obviously given any sort of indication of exactly what happened at the prison. Uh, Uturka, I believe. Or Uturka? I don't know how old you can ask. Um, we're not given any sort of indication as to exactly what happened. Um, but it seems like it was some bad shit. It sounds like this guy and the three prisoners he initially took were the only people who were fucking alive after whatever it is that happened. Okay. Crank that down just a little bit. Um, he mentioned the the narrative mentions the narrator mentions that there's nobody left to uh, give the uh, clothing that he kills the first guard for to. Um, he mentions that, uh, you know, he was, he-, he heard about, like, you know, all the dead bodies you could see from the North Tower, but the North Tower isn't there anymore. Um, uh, so, but we're not given any indication of what the fuck happened, but it sounds like it was some rough shit. But what we are given some details on is this fucking wild-ass knife this dude has. Now, I don't know for sure. Because the, 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 the book has not gone into a huge amount of detail thus far. With, excuse me, what this knife's deal is. But if you've played Dishonored the Death of the Outsider, the way that this knife is described both in how it looks and what its history is, just what small indications were given, you might start thinking it sounds kind of familiar. I'm not going to go ahead and get into that uh, in too much detail because obviously we haven't played Death of the Outsider yet. But, I mean, interesting shit. Interesting shit, to be sure. Uh, and I am definitely uh, looking forward to see if it is confirmed. If my... Oh, shit. If my suspicion is confirmed in this book um, as to whether or not this is the truth. Now, the last thing to talk about is the reason that this guy took his third his third uh, hostage, right? Hold on, I need to make sure that I'm not like... Okay, here we go. So he mentions that he killed the first guy for his clothes. He killed the second guy so that he would be able to use his his tendered meat, his tender meats, to distract uh, any wolves they came across. Came across, but the third guy, he kept on for his bones, which he was going to use for magic. Now, 
Magic in the Dishonored series requires very specific things. Um, it's not just anyone that's going to be able to do magic. Generally, you do need to be chosen by the outsider in order to actually be able to do magic. And in the entire history of the, the, the fucking Isles, the Outsiders only really blessed a few people with his mark. Oh, bumped my mic. So there seems to be a distinct possibility that the man that we're following in this prologue is someone who is chosen by the outsider if he is able to do magic. Because, like, generally speaking, like, stuff like bone charms and, um, runes, they're collected by people as, like, you know, good luck charms and stuff like that, but generally speaking, they bring misfortune more often than they bring actual fortune. And most people aren't going to be able to just, like, make those themselves, you know? So the fact that this guy can do magic would seem to imply that he is a Chosen of the Outsider. Um, not to mention the fact that he seems to have, uh, just based on the blurb on the back of the book, abilities similar to Doubt, who we do know was Chosen by the Outsider. So with that, let's see what happens next. Somewhere in the city of Dunwall, seventh day, month of rain, 1851. Young Lady Emily is undisciplined, I'm afraid. Here within Dunwall Tower, she receives instruction from the finest tutors known in the Isles, yet her mother spoils her. She spends most of her time lost in imagination, wasting her time drawing or asking Corvo to teach her to fight with wooden sticks. The girl might rule the Empire someday. Every moment spent at play is a moment wasted. Field Survey Notes, The Royal Spymaster. Excerpt from the personal memoirs of Hiram Burroughs, dated several years earlier. As she pushed off from the rooftop ledge behind her, three thoughts ran through her mind. One, that the ledge opposite was much farther away than she had estimated, and that there was more, uh, more than fair chance she was going to fall short and tumble to what was most likely a painful and unpleasant death, dash against the cobbles of the street four stories below. Two, that the month of rain was not only the most depressing time of the year, give me the month of high cold any time, she mused, but the waterlogged rain-soaked nights were probably the worst to be out running the rooftops of the city. Three, that her impending and quite clearly unavoidable death wasn't the most regal end for the Empress of the Isles, and that her father was going to be very, very disappointed. A fourth thought of Corvo standing over her broken body, not sad, but annoyed that she hadn't managed to what should have been a simple jump, was quickly knocked out of Emily Caldwin's mind as she hit the flat roof of the building, feet first. Her body, lithe and athletic, driven by reflexes honed and trained over the last decade, absorbed the impact of this misjudged jump by falling into a forward roll, the tails of her black coat catching the puddles and flicking a spray of water up into the air. Finishing the roll, em Emily paused, kneeling on the rooftop, balance on her hands, the rain pouring off the peak of her hood and down into the puddle underneath her. One breath two breaths, three. Well, that wasn't so bad, she thought. Better to overshoot than miss entirely, and not just in the dark, but in the rain. Emily allowed herself a small smile under the hood. Not bad, Empress, not bad at all. Perhaps her father wouldn't be so disappointed with how she was doing, if only he could see her now. She pivoted on her heel, then stood and walked back to the edge. The smile vanished from her sharp, angular features, replaced with a frown she told herself to bloody well pay attention, otherwise the next mistake really would be a fatal one. Yes, it was a long way down, and that was a stupid, stupid thing to try. She'd made it, just barely, thanks to her father's training and her own endless hours of practice leaping around the castellated ramparts of Dunwall Tower, keeping herself well out of sight of the watchman on patrol. Lightning flashed ahead, casting the silhouette of that tower into sharp relief. A moment later, the thunder rolled as loud as cannon fire as it echoed around the stone of the city. It was late, actually early, the hour is very small indeed, 
And with the constant downpour, Emily suspected she was the only person who was out and about. Certainly she was the only person in the entire city commanding a view like this. Turning from the edge, she jogged up to where the building joined the next. The neighbor higher, its roof a jumbled collection of tiled services assembled with all the precision of a child who'd had too much and honey cake. As she approached, Emily accelerated, then jumped to plant one foot on a windowsill, propelling herself up, bouncing against the angle of the wall opposite to go higher, reaching the next portion of roof and pulling herself up with her arms. She continued using the planes and angles of the buildings, its windows, overhangs, ledges, gables, to push up and up and up until after a few minutes, she was standing on top of a small square tower, the highest point, apparently, in this part of the city. She stood tall. Despite the deep hood of her tailcoat, her raven black hair was still soaked. She sighed and pushed the hood back, rain washing over her face as she looked out over the thousand labyrinthine streets and alleys crammed with tall, narrow buildings built of dark crystal granite, or weathered brown thick, or, or hold on, weathered brown brick, their gabled roofs reaching like jagged fingers toward the night sky. This was Dunwall, and this was her city, though that still didn't sit easy with her. Then the lightning flashed again and she ducked down, wary of being seen. Her covert journey from Dunwall Tower across the rooftops to skirt the Boyle Mansion, then across the bridge named after her family, and finally over the narrow buildings that crowded the southern shoreline of the Renhaven River, as an ex was an exercise in secrecy and the state of mind with that such stealth required. But she hadn't been seen. The darkness had helped, and the rain too, and she had been trained well. Ten years of hard work, of toil in the small hours when she wasn't bound by her imperial duties. Ten years of pain, of cuts and bruises, and... Well, quite a lot of blood, actually. For ten years, she had been trained by the best, in fact. Trained by the royal protector himself, Corvo Atano. Royal protector and her father. Even though the years were creeping up on him, he was still the best spy, the best agent, and the best hand-to-hand -hand combatant in the Empire. The rain pounded the rooftop and Emily hunkered down, allowing herself a moment to think about her father. She was grateful for his presence in her life, not just for his protection, the protection he offered her as empress, offered her as daughter, not for his friendship and love and guidance, official and otherwise, but for his skills in the subtle arts of subterfuge, espionage, surveillance, and, of course, stealth and combat. Skills he had been instilling in her these past ten years, more even. Emily smiled again. It was coming up to fifteen years since her coronation. Had it really been that long, 15 years since Hiram Burroughs' self-appointed Lord Regent was thrown from power, 15 years since Emily was restored to the throne left vacant by the murder of her mother, Empress Jasmine Caldwin I. Her mother, murdered on the orders of the Lord Regent himself, part of a conspiracy that had run deep in Dunwall aristocracy, a secret circle that had finally been broken by Corvo himself. It felt like longer to Emily, a lifetime really, and that's exactly what it had been. She had been 10 when her mother died. Now she wasn't yet 25, and she could still feel the pain of her mother's absence, if she allowed herself. Most of the time, she allowed those memories of Empress Jasmine to sleep in her mind. She had to, because despite the tragedy, she had to live her life and do her job. And what a job it was. Fifteen years now, she had ruled the Empire with a firm and just hand, working hard to reverse the damage done by the Lord Regent to Dunwall and the rest of her domain. At the same time, she and Corvo had embarked on another, less public project the result of which allowed Emily to be here, now, crouched on a rooftop in the dead of night. With no palace walls to keep her prisoner, no protocol, no etiquette to bind her actions, her thoughts, out here in the open air, the city was hers. Here, now, alone, she felt she could go anywhere, do anything, and nobody would know a thing about it. Not even Corvo Atano, the royal protector. Because as far as he know, knew, as far as everyone at the palace knew, from the guards on the gate to the members of her inner court deep inside the ancient keep, uh, the Empress was enjoying blissful slumber in her private apartments. Emily laughed, and though the rain lessened slightly, she pulled her hood over her head again. Getting out of the tower had been the easiest part. In her bedchamber, there was a hidden door which led to a secret room, one she had discovered when, she, when still a child, before the death of her mother and before everything changed. She had kept the knowledge to herself, although she knew some older members of the court were aware of the tower's secret rooms and hidden passageways. In the large room beyond her bedchamber, Emily had built up an armory all of her own. Not just weapons and protective clothing, hooded cloaks and caps and coats, but gold, too. Anything that might be useful on her new adventures. Her new adventures outside the palace walls. Although, truth be told, she hadn't needed much of it. 
ropes, grapples, crampons. They just slowed her down. She had taken to using a pair of fingerless gloves, the palm and the tops of the fingers padded, giving her an excellent grip while sparing her hands from the battering they would otherwise have taken as she traveled across the rooftops, leaping from ledge to sill. As Empress, it was her hands, perhaps surprisingly, that she felt most self-conscious of, but for good reason. Because as Empress, they were forever being kissed or held reverently or otherwise brought to close examination by friends and strangers alike. It was a strange life, and it wasn't one to which she was quite accustomed, even after all this time. Emily glanced up, but this seemed only to encourage the skies to open more. Renewed, the rain poured down as heavy as a wool blanket. Yet even above the roar, she heard the clock tower of Dunwall, over by the estate district, chime the second hour of the morning. Emily turned to face the sound. The clock tower was the tallest structure in the city, save for Dunwall Tower itself. For two months, Emily had seen had been exploring the city at night, crossing to the southern bank of the Renhaven River, and then mostly keeping to this part of the city. Perhaps that decision had been subconscious, an effort to avoid being spotted by members of the aristocracy, who mostly occupied the more fashionable quarters north of the river. But the clock tower, now the view from there would be spectacular, even in the rain. It'd make a good climb, too. Another test to pass. Decision made, Emily paused, willing the downpour to ease, if even a little. To her surprise, the elements appeared to obey her royal wish, the torrential downpour lightening again to a shower. Nevertheless, the rooftops would be treacherous, and she would need to take care. There was time to get to the clock tower and then back to the palace before everyone, anyone knew she was gone. In her mind, she ran through her official schedule for the following day. No, for today. But there was nothing much on. She could afford to be tardy. Stealing herself, Emily stepped up the steep incline, her mind already plodding a route across the jumble of buildings and streets ahead. And then, with a smile, she drew her hood down and ran for the edge of the rooftop. So we're still technically in the prologue, but this is like prologue part two. And this is where we, me we meet our girl. We, we meet our girl, Emily Colbwin. Um, so Emily, as you may remember from the first game, uh, was the young girl who was essentially the subject of at least more than, uh, more than one rescue. <laughs> Um, first kidnapped by, uh, the royal spymaster, um, who of course was, uh, who, whose memoirs gave us that lovely excerpt just before this part of the prologue, where he, uh, unfortunately is like, oh, Emily sucks. She's such a bad heir to the throne. Um, and since then, uh, Corvo, not really wanting to, uh, you know, um, leave Emily without any sort of, like, means of protecting herself, uh, has, in the 15 years between the start of this book and, uh, the end of the first game, been training her in the arts of the various espionages and sword fighting and stuff like that. Uh, and of course, this book does open up with acknowledging that, yes, Corvo is Emily's father. Emily is Corvo's daughter. Um, I forget where it is that there is, like, discussion of the fact that um, there was not a stated father for the child when uh, Empress Jessamine initially became credit uh, pregnant. Um, I, I want to say it's mentioned in the first game, but I don't 
really know off the top of my head. Um, but all the same, uh, yes. Uh, the Royal Protector was also her lover. He fathered Emily. Um, she is his daughter by blood. So, you know, that's fun. Um... Um, and it seems like, you know, a lot of that training is pay paying off. Here we have an example of Emily, you know, putting her acrobatic skills honed over a decade and a half to the test, uh, leaping across rooftops, uh, uh, rain slick rooftops in the city of Dunwall, um, in the dead of night. Uh, having completely just snuck out of Dunwall Tower with nobody even seeming to know that she's gone missing. So, you know, good for her, honestly. Um... We also get sort of an implication of uh, something that is going to become contentious when we get to Dishonored 2. And that is exactly how good of an empress Emily is. Hold on one second. Um, as stated at the end of the first game, uh, if you complete it with low chaos, she is a fair and just ruler, and according to the book, she rules the she rules the empire uh, with a fair and just hand. Um. That being said, she is bored out of her skull. It is She is not exactly super jazzed at the idea of spending all of her time doing Empress things. She would rather be out here just like leaping across rooftops, learning to sword fight, learning to drop assassinate people, stab them in the fucking neck. She... The, the the she she yearns for blood you know um alas she has responsibilities but not so much responsibilities that she can't be like ooh i'm going to go climb dunwall clock tower which she does fuck off to do <laughs> I never know, I don't know what to do with this soundtrack, because, like, right now it's really quiet, and I worry that it's not going to, like, actually pick up properly in the VOD. But then, like, later on it's going to get way louder, and I'm going to be worried that it's going to drown me out. God damn it, Daniel Licht. May you rest in peace. You did pretty good on the Silent Hill Downpour soundtrack. Um, but yeah. And then that's where the prologue ends. And it's where our story proper begins. Part 1. The Sleeping City. Chapter 1. The Golden Cat, Distillery District, Dunwall. First day, month of darkness, 1851. There is an establishment within Dunwall called the Golden Cat, 
A bathhouse, I believe, though some say it's a brothel. Missing Women, Golden Cat. Excerpt from a crime story revolving around the Golden Cat. Galia Fleet was having a good night, which was more than could be said for the drunken oaf rolling in the gutter in the alley outside of the back of the Broken Cat. Or the Broken Cat? The Golden Cat, excuse me. Taking a swig from the bottle of Old Dunwall whiskey, Galia looked down at the... What was he exactly? His black velvet jacket had a gold embroidery around the edge, which had looked fancier a few moments before when it hadn't been wet and caked in... Well, in whatever it was the man had fallen into. The waistcoat under the jacket, unsullied by the gutter but stained with a tracery of vomit, was a rich royal purple. It stirred something in the back of Galia's mind. Did the purple mean something, signifying some high office? Or was her memory playing tricks? She shrugged to herself and sucked on the whiskey, then gave the man a kick with the toe of her boot. The moaning imbecile may, might well have been a royal ambassador from a far and distant land, for all that it mattered here. Because of the Golden Cat, names weren't used, identities and ranks were not discussed, everyone was as equal as the coin in their purse. Galia shoved the man again and he rolled with the movement, like a bundle of linen just unloaded from a Horizon Trading Company skiff. He moaned and gurgled in the gutter. His weapon, a sword stick he so foolishly unsheathed while inside the pleasure house, lay in two pieces over by the back door of the cat. That was a shame, she thought. It looked as if it had been a good piece, a vanity accessory for an aristocrat, but one that actually made for a serviceable weapon. Galia would have liked it for herself had she not snapped it in two before picking the man up by the front of his purple waistcoat and throwing him into the muck. The stick would have made a good trophy, a nice addition to the collection of weapons she kept in her office. Being security chief of the cat gave her a lot of leeway with Madame Steele, but even she, daughter of the old proprietor, Madame Prudence, might have raised an eyebrow at the small armory Galia kept locked away out of sight. As Galia eyed the broken stick, the alley swayed pleasantly in her vision as the effects of the whiskey started to take hold. Maybe she could give the weapon to her assistant, Rinaldo, to see if he could get it fixed. Ah, never mind. Too much effort, and she wasn't entirely sure Ronaldo much approved of her little collection. The man in purple in the purple waistcoat moaned again, tried to scramble to his feet, but all he succeeded in doing was getting his ass up into the air while his face was still planted in the gutter, sh in the gutter shite. Galia grinned, unable to resist such an invitation. With a swift jab of her foot, the man went sprawling. Maybe next time you'll think twice before trying to impress our girls with your mighty weapon, eh? Galia said, but she wasn't sure the man was listening. He was puffing like a whaling ship, apparently unaware that he hadn't yet attained an upright position. Galia sighed, hands on her hips, the buzz of the whiskey wearing down to cold melancholy. Is this really what it's come down to? She wondered. Throwing anonymous noblemen out of the golden cat when they tried to get frisky? She was just 35 years old and she liked to think herself in pretty good shape. When the fog of the alcohol settled over her like a shroud, and settled it did most nights now, she felt a good deal older. Sighing again, she swigged at the bottle, held it in one hand while she ran the fingers of the other through her short, greasy blonde hair. Taking a drink of water, give me a sec. Gotta stay hydrated, especially when I'm doing so much fucking talking. Sighing again, uh, wait, no, I read that. Where had the time gone? What had happened to the old days? The days when she was young, the days when she yearned for adventure, and for coin. The days when she wore the mask of her gang and did so with pride. The days when she traveled at the sight of her leader, doing his bidding, following his orders, helping him clean the city of Cretans, and collecting a profit in the process. At least that's what Dowd had told her, and that's what she had believed. Back then, as a 20-year-old novice assassin, she would have followed him to the ends of the world. There was a moment, too, when it seemed as if her luck had come in. Billy Lurk had vanished, and Galia had never been happier. She had never liked Dowd's little enforcer, with her, and with her out of the frame, the chance arose for Galia to step in and show Dowd what she was made of, to show him who really deserved to be his right hand, instead of that gloomy hard-ass. But then he disappeared, too. Soon enough, they all had. Sure, Thomas had taken over leadership of the Whalers, what was left of them anyway, gathering the stragglers and members of a few other minor gangs to form his own new group, but... The man in the purple waistcoat sighed and slumped, face down in the, into the gutter. 
Her train of thought broken, Galia stepped over him and, although thinking twice about it, bent down and rolled him onto his back. A drunk aristocrat was one thing, a dead nobleman drowned in two inches of gutter water was something else altogether. Attention the golden cat could ill afford. Not that the establishment was illegal. Far from it, the Golden Cat was part of Dunwall history, an entertainment palace of great renown, home to theater and burlesque, and the best tavern in the Isles. What went on between the patrons and hostesses in the curtained-off rooms was nobody's business at all. The man in the gutter had passed out, so Galia, ready to give her give him the standard line about being barred, saved her breath and instead just killed the bottle of old Dunwall. Maybe it was for the best. He'd wake up, feel embarrassed and ashamed, and hide himself at the court for a few days before desire and need got the better of him, and he'd come, and he came back. Only when he did, Gali would be ready and waiting. She'd be sure to extract payment before any transactions took place. Turning around, she headed back inside. It was late, the usual evening festivities winding down. The quiet murmur in the cat, punctuated by the occasional laugh and shriek of delight in the last remaining patron, as the last remaining patrons sat and smoked and drank and spent some quality time with the hostesses. Walking through the main parlor, the walls festooned with gilt-framed mirrors and acres of deep red velvet drapery, Gali accounted the men passed out in the various pieces of sumptuous furniture, pipes hanging from his unconscious fingers, the fronts of their trousers undone, their purses far lighter than they had been when they had arrived. This, she thought, this is what life is now. And it wasn't bad. Not really. Galia was the first to admit that. The head of security of the Golden Cat sounded like a cushy job, and actually it was. Things had been changing over the years as the city rebuilt itself. How long had it, had it been since the flooded district had been drained and reconstructed, becoming once again the throbbing financial heart of the Empire? A long time, anyway. That was the problem. Time moved on, but inside the Golden Cat, it was like... Time sat still, caught in amber, never to be, never to move again. Business was good, it always had been. Before, when she had been a whaler, the cat had been... Well, unsavory, really. The haunt of the Lord Regent's officers and guards. Travelers from other islands in the Empire drawn to the temptations offered within its walls. The fortunes of the cat had improved along with those of the city. With the Rat Plague a distant memory and free movement re-established throughout most of the Empire, trade resumed, and with trade came travelers, foreigners, dignitaries. They brought money, and that wealth flowed through Dunwall, refilling the coffers not just of the Imperial Court, but of the citizens, too. Freed from the impressive yoke of the Lord Regent, the city was revived, rebuilt, and was once again pr prosperous. The prosperity found its way to the Golden Cat. Business couldn't be better. Yes, life was good. Her job was easy. Wonderful. What a joy. Galia lifted the empty bottle of old Dunwall and peered at it with disappointed eyes, then headed over to the bar, ducking behind to extract another, unopened bottle. This she took with her, with her as she disappeared through a curtain door back to her office. The room was small, spare, furnished with rugs and a table and a chair, all old and battered and worn, unlike the fittings out in the parlor. In here it didn't matter. She had all she needed, and that included a window that looked out onto the main street. Yes, this was what it had come to. Highly paid job, throwing drunks out of a bar. She missed the old days, when the Golden Cat was... Well, it wasn't. It had never been dangerous, exactly. But it had been interesting. And now the gentrification that was spreading across Dunwall had reached the famous Golden Cat. The clientele had grown richer, but softer, too. Head of security. It felt like overkill. Galia was a trained warrior. No more than that, Galia Fleet was an assassin. Or had been. Once. Once when Dow led the whalers. She sat behind the table, put her feet up, and began to work on uncapping her new bottle of whiskey. She tried to track them down, but the whalers were masters of deception, of slipping undetected across the city, the freedom of which was theirs thanks to the power Dow had allowed them all to share. The only one she'd actually been able to find had been Ronaldo, and he'd come to her. What was it? Five? No, six years ago? He'd come into the cat, his dark features hidden behind a beard, his wild hair streaked with gray, matted into thick, dirty dreadlocks. Uh, but there had been no mistaking the glint in his eye, the way his mouth curled to one side when he smiled, and the scar over his left eye, an echo of a past life, past battle, one in which she, if she remembered rightly, had saved Ronaldo's skin. She took every opportunity to remind him of it. 
had he tracked her down to the golden cat to reminisce over old times or come into a partake of the pleasures of the establishment without realizing she was there? Galia had never found out, but they talked, but they had talked and laughed and drank, and at Galia's request, the proprietor had given the former assassin a one-time discount. After that, she offered him a job, one he sorely needed. Galia and Ronaldo united again, keeping safe the courtesans of the, cold, of the golden cat. Ronaldo might not have expected to find Galia working at the cat, but he admitted that he too had been looking for old friends from time to time without much luck. Some had gained employment on trading vessels, others on whaling ships, or in the whale oil processing factories. They'd laughed at that. Whalers becoming whalers. Changing jobs, but not their masks. The bottle cap finally came loose, and Galia took a long gulp of the fiery liquid as she glanced over to the bookcase on her right. The shelves, like most of the room, were bare. Save for the whaler's mask. Pride of place and the... Hold on. Pride of place in the center of the bookcase. Gathering dust. Hello, just Scott. Welcome. Not a day went by when Galia hadn't wished Dowd were here. It had been years, 14 at least, Galia thought, pretending not to have counted the days one by one by one. And in that time, the itch had not faded away. If anything, it had grown stronger and stronger, the itch becoming an ache, becoming a burning agony in her mind. The drink helped, of course, dulling the pain along with the rest of her senses. That itch, that ache, wasn't a pang for adventure, or for danger, though, although Galia knew she craved both of those things. Her new life was easy, it was safe. Two things Galia always thought she would abhor. There was no pleasure in life if you took it for granted. Life was to be fought for, to be risked, in order to, to be truly appreciated. But the ache, it was more than that. She'd worked hard at burying it in her mind, but recently it had bubbled to the surface more and more. It didn't matter how much she drank, how much she trained, alone in her apartment at the top of the building, trying to keep herself in condition, even as nothing more than the simple passage of time took it away from her. It's bite-bite time? No, it's not. It's book time. I'm not biting anything. I'm reading. Where was I? Keep herself in condition even as the more simple passage of time took it away from her. What she wanted was what Dowd had given her, as he had given to all his whalers. Galia closed her eyes, and there, just there, as she squeezed her eyelids closed and watched the darkness moving and sparking blue like a shorting whale oil tank, she saw the memory, and she imagined herself tr transversing. The turning of the world stopped for just a split second as she pulled herself across the rooftops of the city, crossing an alley a street as she came up behind an unwitting target, the blade in her hand already sinking to the hilt in the victim's side before they even knew she was there. I want to bite book. Don't do that. Book not for bite, book for read. That was the power. Dowd's gift. To move in the blink of an eye, the geometry of the world unfolding just for her, for his whalers, allowing them a freedom of movement that was beyond the imagining of most people. That kind of movement transversing, that was power. She hadn't missed it at first. To be free of Dowd's thrall was like waking up on a cold morning, sober, alive, aware, energized. A reaction, perhaps, to the withdrawal of Dowd's gift. It got worse after that, becoming a pain that was almost physical, driving her first to despair and then to hard liquor. At first, working at the cat provided an outlet, something new on which to focus, but soon enough it became, like everything in life, merely ordinary. A routine to be repeated every single day. It had taken years to realize how far she had fallen. One day Galia woke up and the city looked different. She realized she had lost weeks, months, years to her misery, to the pain, a pain she had grown to love. So she embraced it. She used it. She began training again, returning to the life of a whaler, if not to the old job. The world had moved on and left her behind, and now she raced to catch up. The drink helped, of course, as it always had. Ronaldo didn't approve. Galia wasn't sure she'd ever seen that man taste a single drop. It was a thump from outside the office door, heavy and wooden, ending with a rattle. Or, there was a thump from the outside of the office door, heavy and wooden, ending with a rattle. Galia blinked out of her reverie and cocked her head, listening. She recognized the sound. Someone had thrown open the front door with quite some force. Another drunk... No. The same drunk. That bloody oaf with the sword stick. He'd probably been found by his friends, and now they were coming back to cause a little scene. Young aristocrats were all the bloody same. Though they owned the bloody place. Thought they owned the bloody... Fucking... Thought they owned the bloody place. Fine. 
that's the game they want to play, then so be it. It was time to show these young idiots who was in charge, no matter the, no matter the lineage of their birth or the amount of coin in their purses. Galia dragged her feet off the table and made her way to the door. She paused there and listened. She could hear the talking, murmurs really, nothing that sounded out of the ordinary. She relaxed. Maybe they'd gone on their way. Maybe Ronaldo and the other guards had seen them off. Good. She turned from the door, her eyes back on the bottle of old Dunwall whiskey on her desk. There was a crash from the parlor and shouting. Lots of shouting. The surprise helped to sober her up. She wheeled around and yanked open the front the office door, then ripped aside the curtain that hid it from the parlor. She pulled the knife from her belt. What in the high overseer's balls is going on here? She shouted. The parlor was in chaos. The courtesans and their clients, most half-drunk or worse, most half-dressed or worse, were running to the back of the room and beyond, clothes hastily grabbed, veils held high. A couple even stood behind one of the big velvet curtains, the drapery pulled around their bodies for protection. In the center of the room stood Ronaldo and three of the cat's minders, knives out, standing by to protect the clients and keep their new visitor in bed. The visitor didn't move from the doorway. He wore a dark woolen greatcoat and red epaulets with brass buttons. The collar of the greatcoat was pulled up so high that it formed a black fan beneath the man's head. Under the collar, his neck was wrapped in a woven fur scarf that was pulled up over his mouth and nose. The upper part of his face was likewise hidden behind two great red circular glass eyepieces, each nearly as big as the saucer of a fine Morley tea set. The outlandish heavy outfit was topped off by a black hat with a huge circular brim which pushed against the top of the overturned great collar. Overturned coat collar. His hands were encased in thick leather gloves. He stood, motionless, like a mannequin from a draper's ward fashion house. Ronaldo rolled his neck and lifted his knife toward the intruder. I don't know who you are, friend, but this ain't no way to go about it. You either show yourself and show your coin, or we throw you into the gutter out back and deduct a fee for our services. The intruder didn't speak. It looked as if he was just standing, staring, but Galia knew he was likely scanning the whole room and those in it, his eyes completely hidden behind his goggles. His gloved hands were curled in fists, and there was no way to know what, was, what weapons he was hiding underneath the huge coat. It might have been the month of darkness, but it was hardly that cold outside, even at this time of night. There was no reason for the strange getup, unless he was hiding something. Okay, that's enough, Galia said, taking a step toward the man, her own knife held out in front, but the words caught in her throat as the intruder turned his face toward her. It was unnerving, the way she couldn't see it. In fact, all she could see was her own distorted reflection in his goggles. She glanced down at his hands. He wasn't reaching for anything, and the buttons of his coat were fastened up to the neck. He was hiding something underneath, there didn't seem to be any way of getting it out quickly. Galia frowned, then nodded her head at the security detail. Ronaldo, show our friend here the exit, and use your knife on his purse strings. Ronaldo grunted a reply and took a step forward. That was when the intruder sprang to life. His elbow came up and out, and he swung backward, catching Ronaldo in the chest. Ronaldo staggered, but only briefly. Recovering in an instant, he and his men rushed toward the interloper. Galia, too, her knife head heading straight for the man's scarf-wrapped neck. Suddenly, she stumbled and stood, nearly tripping over Ronaldo and the others. The man had gone, vanished, between the blinks of an eye. There was a gasp from the cat's patrons, most of whom were still cowering at the back of the parlor. Galia spun her knife out, searching, not not quite believing what she had seen. Behind her, Ronaldo and the others recovered and fanned out, creeping forward, each of the three men facing a different corner of the room. It was impossible. Impossible. Galia stopped. No, not impossible. Improbable, perhaps, but she had seen something like that before. In fact, she had been able to do it herself many years ago. Before Dowd had slipped away, leaving it all behind, taking the magic with him. Show yourself, she yelled, and the patrons gasped again in fright. There was a crunching sound. Gali and the others spun to face it and saw the intruder standing on the other side of the room. No, he wasn't. It was his reflection in the huge mirror with Baroque gold frame one of many that hung all over the parlor walls. Galia spun away from the mirror, her instinct telling her the stranger was standing behind her. But he wasn't. She turned back, just in time to see the man's reflection move out of the mirror and into the room, his own reflection becoming visible behind him. Galia gritted her teeth. 
That's some trick, she said, but she picked the wrong parlor to show it off in. She rushed forward, Ronaldo and the others behind her. Now this, this was a good night. She hadn't had to cut a patron open in a long time. But the intruder was fast, even under the heavy winter clothing. Expertly, he blocked Gallia's attack, parrying with an arm and reposting with the other. Ronaldo and the other two security guards joined the fray. Together, they had surrounded the intruder. They were trained, ready and able to fight. So, it seemed, was the intruder. At the center of the fray, he was a dervish, the tails of his coat whirling as he blocked, attacked, counterattacked. Galia's knife and Ronaldo's too made several palpable hits, but their sharpened blades were unable to penetrate the thick cloth of the coat. Within moments, one of the security men was down, blood arcing from his face as he careened backwards, eliciting more screams from the patrons. Galia sat it, saw it out of the corner of her eye and yelled as she redoubled her efforts. As she fought, she saw Ronaldo grin on the other side of the intruder. He was enjoying it as much as she was just like old times. The intruder struggled, staggered under the attack. Galia pressed the advantage, forcing him back against the wall, against another of the large mirrors. There was a crunching sound, like boots on snow. The man was gone. A shadow shape out of the quarter of her eye, Galia turned and saw the man stepping out of another mirror among the huddled patrons. They screamed and scrambled away, but the man ignored them. The last of Galia's men charged, but was knocked down almost instantly. Galia sighed, Ronaldo tensed, but she reached out and grabbed his shirt. No, wait, she said. The two of them faced the intruder, who apparently was none the worse for wear. His scarf, hat, and goggles still in place, he did not move. Galia stepped forward. She looked up into those goggles, tossing her blade end over end in her hand. Then she caught the handle and returned the weapon to its sheath on her belt. Hey, Galia, sweetness, Ronaldo said. What are you- Shut up, Ronaldo. Galia cocked her head. She felt... Actually, she felt good. Lightheaded, and not just from the whiskey. She had enjoyed the fight. Okay, so that wasn't quite why she was in this job. But more than that, seeing the stranger, the intruder, had rekindled a fire within her that was many, many years cold. This stranger wore a strange outfit more suited to the snows of Tivia, who fought like a soldier who could move in the blink of an eye, traveling through, it seemed, mirrors. It wasn't transversal, the ability to stop time and pull yourself across two points in space, the gift that Dowd had shared with the whalers, but it was close. It was a power, too. She looked into the stranger's red eyes and was overcome with a vertigo, the sensation of falling. Falling. She saw men, lots and lots of men, their heads covered with hoods, their faces obscured by large masks, with glass eyes, respirator cans bouncing as they slaughtered the enemy, the city watch, the Renhaven River Patrol falling before them. In front, a whaler in a dark red coat, a leader, the best of the best, the leader called out, and Galia recognized the voice. It was her voice. These were her men. She was a leader. She was the best of the best. And then Galia, the leader, vanished in a swirl of inky nothing, and then her men followed. Galia swayed on her feet, the room snapping back into focus. She felt the itch, the ache, burning inside her. For just a moment, just a second, Galia wanted to scream her desire, her demand for a share of that power to the strange intruder. And then the feeling was gone. She pursed her lips. She had to know. Had to know who the man was, why he was there. He wasn't Dowd. He was too tall. But then again, the disguise, the clothing, the power. Maybe he knew Dowd. Maybe he... Galia Fleet, the intruder said, and Galia gasped and took a step backward. The voice was loud but muffled. Male, deep resonant, but rough, dry. She would have thought he sounded sick if it wasn't for the fact that he had easily bested four security guards. She opened her mouth, but no words came out. I'm not here to fight you, Galia, the intruder said. I'm here to rescue you. Okay. So 
Our first character in the start of the story proper is Galia Fleet. She is a former whaler, a the group of assassins head up headed up by the assassin Dowd. Uh, we saw a lot of the whalers in the in the first game, uh, in the flooded district, in the Dowd DLC, and we know that in order to facilitate their abilities, Dowd had to share the power gifted to him by the outsider with them. Um, now this isn't the f this is probably the first time, sort of canonically, in the series that we see this. Uh, aspect of the... Oh, hold on. I gotta stretch. Oh, God. Okay. This is the first time that we see sort of like an in-universe example of like what kind of happens when the head of one of these like groups or factions just sort of fucks off and leaves everyone to fend for themselves. It's not the last time we'll see it. We're gonna see it again in Death of the Outsider. Uh... But for this book, we're looking at it from the perspective of the Whalers. Um, when Dowd left, he took his power with him. There is unfortunately no way to for somebody to essentially permanently have power without being gifted to it, gifted it by the outsider. And the Outsider only gives power to people he finds interesting. For example, um, in the first game we learn that uh, Anton Sokolov uh, is evidently... Or evidently has been attempting to contact the outsider himself through all sorts of man of like arcane trickery, um, with the hope that he will be given some measure of ability. And the outsider is aware of all this, but hasn't seen fit to bestow anything on him because he quite frankly just doesn't find Sokolov particularly interesting. Meanwhile, he's come a lot closer to Piero. Uh, Sokolov's um, sort of alternate in the first game, the one who gives you all of your upgrades. Um, Piero describing how he would get all sorts of like dreams and nightmares whenever he slept, and the outsider admitting that just like, yeah, I'm fucking with him. I'm fuck. I I I like to fuck with the guy. It's fun. <laughs> um. But the Outsider having essentially access to, like, the whole of history uh, up to a certain point. Um, it's basically can look at all of the directions a person's life might take them, should he give them any degree of power, and makes decisions based on that on with regards to, like, who he's going to provide it to. So, like, you know, he'll look at the life of, like, Dowd. He'll look at the life of Corvo. He'll look at the life of Delilah Copperspoon and be like, you know what? These people seem neat. They seem like they'll do some whack-ass shit in the future. Granny Rags is another one. Uh, I think there might be another guy in the second game. I'm not sure, but basically, like, it's, and evidently, this guy as well, so it would seem. We haven't gotten any sort of indication just yet that he is chosen by the Outsider, but maybe. That being said, any sort of power presented to um, a witch in Delilah's Coven or a member of the Whalers under Dowd is temporary and dependent on those individuals still being there. So when Dowd leaves, he takes all that power with him.
And I mean, like, what do you do there, you know? What do you do with a drunken whaler? What do you do when you've spent so much of your life having all of this, like, power, being able to just, like, pop, 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 teleport across rooftops, grab things with, like, fucking tell of kinesis be able to like see things in the dark be able to see through walls what do you do when you have all of that and then one day it's just gone you know now according to what she's saying here initially there appears to be some sort of like mental strain uh put on someone by virtue of being gifted these abilities so initially waking up from having those powers apparently doesn't actually feel too bad and feels like you are like waking from a dream but then as you go on like it sucks you know just like missing everything it's basically it sounds like almost like being an addict you know you get addicted to the power uh now as i said galia has gotten a uh, job as head of security at the Golden Cat. Now, the Golden Cat is a location from the first game. You go there to rescue Emily because it's where she's being held. The Golden Cat is basically a brothel. Like, you know, it, it's like it's like the book and the game says, like, you know, it, it's it's touted as a bathhouse oh it's the, got the best tavern and all of dunwall uh but like people people go there to get to to fuck people fuck here people are fucking in this establishment and what do we gain from perhaps pretending that there don't be a lot of fucking going on in here you know? There, there's so much. People be getting dicked down left and right. Um. But, you know, it's just kind of one of, like... You also see this in Death of the Outsider with people who were given this power as from as part of like being in a sort of uh, organization and then afterwards like they're depressed, they're practically recovering addicts and they're just taking what jobs they can. Galia is unhappy. She went from having all this power to being a glorified bouncer. The bouncer. Um, and I mean, it sounds like it sucks. It sounds like it's a shit situation to be in, you know? Um, she's managed to find at least one friend from the old days, but then, but then, but then. Mr. Tall, Dark, and Magic shows up, and he's stepping through, he's a step stepping through, uh, mirrors to teleport from, like, one side of the room to the other. Now... This isn't an ability that, like, say, we get at any point in any of the games. It's not something that Corvo can do. It's not something that Emily can do. It's not something that Billy Lurk can do. It's not something that Dowd can do. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything in terms of, like, oh, this person should be able to do that. You can't do that in the game. Because, you know, the Brigmore witches have all sorts of wild shit that they can do that aren't anything that any of our protagonists can do. So, I mean... You know, just fucking... Whatever, man. Um... 
so yeah, why not just let this that let this guy just like step step through some through some mirrors? It's fine. It's fine. Look. It's fine, okay? Just don't 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 fucking worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um All right. And our chapter so like they have they have like a big dumb fight. And this strange man who is explicitly the guy who escaped from the Tivian prison, like let's not pretend that he isn't. He's wearing the same clothes. And everything. Um, just wipes the floor with these guys. He's just completely fucking styling on them. Like, he's s briefly staggered, but then he's just fucking gone. You know? Um, but then... Galia out here does something very strange. She stops. She stops fighting because, among other things, she's actually realizing that she's kind of having a good time fighting against this guy, and she... And she's also realizing that, hey, this dude has power. This dude has power like Dowd had power. And it seems what's going on is that she is contemplating possibly joining him. And he seems to have the same idea. Because he tells her that he's here to rescue her, not fight her. So, it seems like whoever this guy is, whoever this mysterious person who's definitely not Dowd, they have established he's not Dowd, why would it be Dowd? He's too tall for it to be Dowd. Dowd's a short king. <laughs> he's not really a short king. I, th I think he's actually fairly, fairly tall. But this guy's like, big. Um, so the question becomes here, why is he looking for Galia? Is he looking for Galia specifically? Or is he tracking down former whalers? And to what end? And that is the question that we will, will, we will hopefully learn as we going as 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 we go along. There's a new problem for FF14, right? Give me a second. What the fuck does fulsome mean? Hold on. Hold on. Wholesome definition. Complimentary or flattering to an excessive degree, lar of large size or quantity, generous or abundant. Ah, okay. What the fuck? I figure something out. I'm still working on FF14, right? I did do day 21. I just haven't posted it to Twitter yet. It is up on my co-host, though. Anyways, next chapter. Hold on, I need to reply to something on Twitter. Actually, no. No, I don't want to reply to something on Twitter. I believe I will let that play out as it may. Alright, chapter 2. New Mercantile District, Dunwall. Eighth day, the month of darkness, 1851. At times I have ventured beyond the city walls, meeting in forgotten graveyards and the outlying ruins frequented by those of ill means. Rumors and sightings, Dowd. Excerpt from an overseer's covert field report. 
Emily peered over the edge of the building, which stood on the western side of the large square. She peered down and for a moment held her breath, wondering what in all the aisles was going on. It was late, later than she would have liked, but she'd come a long way. Perhaps too far. Out of Dunwall Tower, over Caldwin's Bridge, and skirting the Boyle Mansion, up to the tall clock tower on the northern border of the estate district. At the clock tower, she paused a while, considering her next route of exploration. It was a cold night, but a calm one. The rains and winds that came with a dreary inevitability over the last couple of months had given way to short days and long nights as the chills swept in over the city. Tonight, the drizzle was merely irritating, and between the broken clouds above, there was a moon that shone full and bright. North. She would go north up to the edge of the city where there was a lot of new construction, whole new districts slowly growing up as the walls of Dunwall were extended outward, and the only direction the city really could expand. It was an area she didn't know well, but to her that was part of the reason for these nocturnal excursions. This was her city, legally speaking, and it was a city she wanted to know as well as the inside of Dunwall Tower itself. From the clock tower she followed a broad avenue that took her not directly north, but northwest. She traveled for perhaps an hour, stopping to watch, to observe. The streets were quiet and Emily had taken the usual precautions, sticking to the shadows and eaves, uh, keeping out of sight of windows and doorways, and the streets themselves as much as possible. She'd seen a few people moving around, a couple of patrols of the city watch, a couple of couples making, their, making a damp journey home from whatever evening's entertainment they'd had enjoyed. That was one benefit of exploring at this time of the year. It was cold, but not that cold so she could move around unnoticed. The early call of winter was enough to keep people inside when the hours grew small, but without freezing her to death in the process. Eventually, she found the old city wall, and skipping through the shadows past a patrol of the city watch, she crossed over. This was new territory, a city growing to absorb the small towns and villages that had once been separate. Here, she crouched in the high gables of a tall house, one of a dozen that had surrounded the old square. Except, it wasn't a square, not quite. As Emily looked down, it took her a moment to realize that the streets in this new district were more than quiet. They were empty, literally so. The district appeared to be mostly residential, the houses pressed tightly against each other in rows like most other parts of the city, although here they were bigger, with narrow alleyways separating the buildings at regular intervals. It looked like a nice area, but Emily realized these large, lavish homes were in fact completely unoccupied. Perhaps that wasn't such a surprise, she told herself. The rat plague may have been a decade and a half gone, but the city had been hit hard. In some areas, residents had been forced from their homes as the streets became too dangerous, as household after household succumbed to the disease, transforming neighbors, family, friends into weepers. That, in turn, became an open invitation for the gangs to move in. The Bottle Street Gang, the Dead Eels, the Hatters, and later the Parliament Street Cutters. Areas of the city that once provided happy homes for happy families became derelict badlands, areas that even the city watch left to their own devices. But that was before. History. Ancient. Dunwall had changed. The Rat Plague was a footnote in the past, and with Emily's guidance, the city was rebuilding itself, which included expansion north beyond the city walls. Places like this. Emily looked closer. As Emily looked closer, she could see that the homes were here were not derelict, though they did show signs of neglect. The square and the buildings that orbited it had most likely been part of a large village or small town, once hit hard by the plague and abandoned. Then, as the city rebuilt itself, the whole place had most likely been bought up in one job lot by a developer. It wasn't uncommon. So for now, the houses slept, patiently awaiting repair and restoration. I need a moment, real quick here. Blech. I need to just check my posture real quick, because my back... Ugh. Go in shrimp mode. Woo. Change my sitting position. Mitty's gonna knock a can over. Thanks, Mitty. You haven't vomited again, have you? Mitty vomited on my computer yesterday, and uh, now my keyboard doesn't work, so I had to supplement it with my work keyboard. Uh, I'm getting a new one today. Uh, between streams, most likely. shark over here looking like a cashew. Exactly. Hi, Moose. Yeah? You can't really come up here. Mitty's over here and she's gonna hiss at you. Our cat Moose has arrived. Mitty doesn't like him very much. She 
she she hisses and growls at him pretty much all the time. We're trying to get her to be a little bit more used to him, but, you know. We've been trying for a while now. <laughs> but she's just gumpy. She's a gumpy baby. Moose, I'm sorry Mitty's such a gumpy baby. <laughs> Sorry, distracted by cats. And a look back at my memories. That is art that I commissioned. Thank you, OneDrive. <sighs> Alright. For now, they were empty. The square in the center was not... Emily ducked down, crawling forward on her elbows to the lip of the rooftop to get a better look. Reaching the edge, she pulled her hood up. Water trickled from its peak down her nose, and she wiped it away. She shuffled on her stomach and brought out her spyglass, a short, ornate tube of dark metal and brass fittings. She placed it against her right eye and adjusted the geared wheels with both hands, bringing the scene, the men at work far below, into sharp focus. The square was perhaps 100 yards along each side, and was bordered by high black iron rails. It appeared to be a private park of some kind for the residents. Overgrown now, the grass long, the twisted metalwork of pergolas and ornate bench seats scattered around it, once a scene of reflection and relaxation, now choked with weeds. At the far corner stood a gnarled tree, its bare... <clears throat> its bare branches, reaching for the night sky like skeletal fingers silhouetted in the moonlight. There was something else in the park, aside from the ironwork and the seats. Pale in the moonlight, there was a series of standing stones, some nearly covered by grass that was waist-high. They were arranged in crooked rows, the stones themselves keening at odd angles. Some had fallen altogether. This wasn't a park or a private garden, Emily realized with a start. She lowered the spyglass to look with her own unaided eyes. It was a cemetery. Which made the people who were working in it, under the cover of moonlit darkness, grave robbers. Emily looked again through the spyglass, twisting the mechanism to zoom out as much as possible. There were five of them, each wore a long coat against the cold, heads covered like Emily's with a hood. But unlike her, each of them appeared to be masked. They worked by the dim yellow light of hooded lanterns, the weak illumination hardly adequate for any kind of labor, Emily thought. Occasionally, that light caught their faces, but from her high vantage point, even with the spyglass, Emily could see nothing but sharp glinting, as though they were wearing eyeglasses or goggles. Over on the west side of the cemetery stood a pair of big iron gates that hung permanently open, their metalwork caught in thick branches of shrubbery that had grown through them over the years. Next to the gates was a covered wagon. The horse shackled to the front was silent and unmoving. I keep feeling like I see something out of the corner of my eye, and I hate it. Its breath steaming in the cold night as they continued their work, continued their digging. The cemetery looked old. One man leaned against one of the taller, more upright stones as he watched two of his cohorts, the pair standing waist-deep in an open grave. They continued to mine beneath their feet. Beside the hole stood another pair. A moment later, they stopped digging. Emily couldn't hear any of them speak, but the three who had been watching sprang into action, waving and gesticulating at one another. One of the diggers climbed out of the grave with some help, while the second digger bent down, disappearing out of Emily's sight and into the earth. The remaining group gathered around, bending down, some kneeling, some reaching into the grave. Slowly, awkwardly, a long box was brought up and shunted sideways into the embankment of freshly dug earth. Emily twisted the spyglass to get a better look. The man standing, still standing on the grave climbed out on his knees and shuffled over in the mud. He felt around the edge of the exhumed coffin like he was checking for something. Then, apparently satisfied, he braced himself on it to push himself to his feet. He waved at the others. Two men grabbed the coffin, one at either end, and lifted, carrying it swiftly across the cemetery through the open gates. Two others jogged in front of the, in front to peel back the canvas cover of the wagon in preparation to receive the sarcophagus. The Skarmophagogs. Emily zoomed out again, then gasped, heart racing, as she saw what was in the back of the wagon. More coffins. Four, perhaps five of the new additions slotted in next to the others. Emily turned her attention back to the small cemetery, scanning it through the spyglass. 
The group had been busy. Several graves had been disturbed, apparently dug up, burials dragged to the surface. She had missed them before, the piles of dark earth melting into the shadows of the overgrown burial ground. What in all the aisles is going on? Emily thought. Were they clearing the site? Maybe the whole area, houses and all, was going to be demolished, which meant relocating the cemetery so work could take place. That was logical, but she knew that wasn't the answer. There was something about them and their work that turned her stomach. If their activities had been legitimate, they would hardly be doing the work in the dead of night, wouldn't they? Anything like this would be done during the day. The work supervised by the city watch, or at least a city planning official. Emily didn't know the minutiae of and everything that was going on in Dunwall as it was being rebuilt. That was impossible and unnecessary, but she could easily check. No, there was something sinister about it. The way the people were not just hooded, but masked. The way they worked in silence in the night under the greasy and flickering sickly yellow light of their lanterns. I gotta make a gross noise real quick, one second. Okay. There was nothing normal, nothing official about it. They were grave robbers, plain and simple. Perhaps the... I need to stop seeing things out of the corner of my eye. Get out of here, phantom bugs. Perhaps the remnants of one of the old street gangs looking for a new source of income, plundering the riches buried with the dead. The thought brought a cold, hard lump to Emily's stomach. She slid back along the flat roof, back into the shade of the gable behind her, thinking the situation over in her mind. She came to a decision. An obvious one. There were five masked strangers. They were preoccupied with their grisly task, and they thought they were alone. Five robbers and one of her. The answer came easily. She could take them on. She could stop them, put an end to their night of work, their night work of horror. She knew she could. She crawled forward again, scanning the cemetery, the thieves, the surrounding buildings. She could take them. She knew it. Kovro had taught her well, and this was the perfect opportunity to put that training to a practical use. This was her city. Emily slipped the spyglass back into her jacket, then looked around the cemetery and the houses. She calculated positions, rehearsed movements in her mind as, as she watched them head back into the cemetery, moving to the next grave. It occurred to her there were, they were more than likely armed, if this was a secret, hidden crime. That was fine. Just fine. She looked up, assessed her surroundings, calculated that if she moved across to the eastern side of the square, there was one building that had an elaborate porticoed balcony that jutted out over the street below, practically hanging over the railed edge of the cemetery itself. She could pick a route down to the ground, using shadows and vegetation to hide her progress until she was in striking distance. The robbers would be busy digging. She would have an easy advantage. She could do this. She knew it. She lifted herself from the damp roof, then glanced to her right, checking her path. Up to the roof of the neighboring building, which stands half a floor higher. Across the top, down to the window ledge of the building at the corner. Up the heavy drain of the building, then across that roof, out onto the overhang. Drop down onto the balcony, hide in the shadows behind the pillars, and check the situation. Reassess. Choose the next path. Thieves would never see her, see her coming. Emily turned and ran in a crouch toward her first obstacle. Then she stopped and ducked down, dropping herself nearly flat onto the rooftop. Heart thudding in her chest, she lifted her chin and glanced across the balcony that was her intended destination. There was someone already there. They were hiding and hiding well, but Emily's trained eye saw the movement, and now she saw the man as clear as if he was standing out in the open. He was nothing but a shadow, but he was wearing a hood and, yes, a mask too. Of course, a lookout. He hadn't signaled yet, which meant he hadn't seen her. Emily breathed a sigh of relief. Well, no matter, she thought. He could be taken out, too. Although... She re-examined her proposed route. It was no good. While it would keep her well hidden from the cemetery and the men working below, she would be in plain sight of the high balcony in the lookout. She'd be seen. In fact... Emily froze, slowing her breathing by instinct, willing herself to vanish into the shadows to become just part of the roof, hidden in the night, a bundle of nothing. The lookout was stood behind a pillar, but he appeared to be... No, he was looking straight at her, the moonlight betraying his presence as it glinted off his mask. Now she'd be seen. He would alert his friends any second, the element of surprise of fading memory. They'd be ready and waiting, and even though she was up for the fight, the addition of the lookout and who knew 
how many others might be lurking in the empty buildings, unseen. The odds didn't feel quite as certain any longer. There was nothing for it. She had to leave. She was an empress of the Isles. She shouldn't have been here in the first place, and she shouldn't and she certainly couldn't die here. As soon as the lookout turned, the seconds felt like minutes as they ticked past in Emily's mind as she lay on the rooftop, not daring to move, watching the lookout. He hadn't moved either, nor had he signaled his friends. Perhaps he wasn't sure. Perhaps, like her, he was waiting, counting time, waiting to be sure. And then he was gone, having retreated into the shadows in the blink of an eye, probably on his way down to his friends through the empty house to tell them about the spy on the roof. Emily left out, let out a long, hot breath and decided to call it a night. There were other ways of investigating the grave robbers, more official ways. She felt suddenly stupid and suddenly afraid of the terrible risk she prepared, she'd been prepared to take. She made a new decision, to retreat to the safety of Dunwall Tower. In the morning, she'd send a patrol of the city watch out to investigate, and she'd ask Corvo if his spy network had heard or seen anything strange. Backing up on her elbows, she edged into the shadowed gables, the cemetery and the grave robbers vanishing from her eyeline as she continued their silent as they continued their silent criminal work. She expected an alarm, a shout, but none came. Yet. Emily turned and headed for home. What a fucked up song. Like, can y'all not? This is also like the loudest track on the fucking sound of the fucking OST. What is this? At any rate. So we have here a full chapter, 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 focus on our girl, Emily Caldwin. Now, the way that it's set up almost seems like it's continuation of her bit in the prologue, but the bit in the prologue took place during the month of rains. Whereas this, chapter 2, takes place in the month of darkness. Um, which would mean... Let's see here. It's like when... I don't know, like, the exact dates of when everything takes place in this series, unfortunately. Uh, but Dishonored Calendar. So the months in Dishonored are the month of earth, harvest, nets, rain, wind, darkness, high cold, ice, hearths, seeds, timber, clans, and songs. So the fact that the prologue takes place in the month of rains, and this chapter takes place in the month of darkness. Oh boy, hold up. Possibility of cats interacting. Minnie, don't hiss at him. He's not even doing anything to you. Calm down. Moose, can I help you? I was going to say it got a bit loud. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why Drunken Whaler is so fucking loud compared to the rest of it. Moose, Moose, don't step on the keyboard. Don't step on the keyboard, Moose. Here, let me... Let's try moving this stuff over. You want to go up on the PS4? I need you to do something. I need you to make a decision. Rubbing your face against my hand is a very cute decision. But I need you to, like, go somewhere. Moose is thinking. Give him a second.
That's the tower of stuff I have on top of my PS4, yes. I know, I know, I need to do something with it, but like... I only have so much shelf space in here, you know? Yeah, the problem is that, like, if I turn it down too much... I worry that, like, the rest of the soundtrack will be too quiet. That it'll just seem like I'm sitting here in silence talking to myself. But, like, if I have it up so the rest of the soundtrack can be heard... Then Drunken Wailer ends up being way too fucking loud. Moose, I need you to make a decision. You can't just hang out on my desk. I'm sorry. Thank you. Midi, you be nice. All right. So this takes place two months after the prologue. Uh, so as it seems, um, Emily has uh, perfected her route to Dunwall to the Dunwall Clock Tower. Um. Ugh, excuse me. Now, Emily mentions the Rat Plague and the effect that it had on the city. The Rat Plague, unfortunately, had a very, very devastating effect on the city of Dunwall. Um, and she mentions how there's a lot of, like, abandoned areas that, like, now that they are expanding the borders of the city they're starting to sort of, like, absorb back into Dunwall. Places that just straight up, nobody's fucking living there because everyone fucking died. Or at the very least died and or fleed, you know? Because they didn't want to die. <laughs> um... And it seems like the intention is that with a lot of these areas that are being reabsorbed into Dunwall, things are going to be um, repaired, refurbished, and I, I would, I guess, ideally hope are going to be offered to people to move into. But she did mention how, like, you know, development companies and stuff like that seem to be buying up these areas. So who knows how well that's all going to fucking go. But, uh-oh. Grave wobbers. Supposedly. They might be grave robbers. They seem to be grave robber-esque. You know, they're out here doing their work in the dead of night. Um, wearing suspicious clothing. With no, like, city watch or city planner to accompany them. So they, they could be grave robbers. And Emily is just like, yo, I can fucking take them. She yearns for it. She wants blood. She wants to fight. She wants to kill. Everybody wants to just fucking scrap in this series. Everybody's just like, yo, you know what would be cool right now? If I got into a fucking fight. If I got into a fight and got to kill somebody. That'd be dope as hell. Kids. Don't kill people. That's just a little pro tip for life from your from your friends here at the Shark Stream. Don't kill people. <laughs> um, and we get a really neat moment of Emily planning out her route. And it's almost like the sort of thing that you would do if you were actually playing the game, you know? Looking at the surroundings, deciding, okay, I can hop from there to there, then there to there, so on and so forth. Um, and it's kind of a neat little moment, you know? Uh, 
it's it's a it's a weird thing where it's just like so many so much of the time like actually writing about like actually writing scenes in a book like this that's like an adaptation of like a video game can be odd on occasion because like we're talking about like you know you have to have moments where uh you have to like describe something happened that happens in the game so like if you're like playing if you're doing a book based on a hack and slash game like darksiders you have to write about darksiders-esque combat if you're writing a book based on an fps like halo you have to write about like the gunfights and like what you do in that just like oh taking cover throwing grenades rolling to the side shooting shoot bang um usually it's pretty dull honestly where it's just like okay that's that's fine um it is kind of fun to watch a character like this in in a book like this planning out their infiltration route the same way that you would in the actual game of Dishonored. So, it's it's neat. It's cool, it's neat, I like it. Uh, but uh-oh. Emily spies somebody along her route who could see her and seems to actually see her. But strangely, despite the fact that it seems like they see her, um, they don't say anything. They don't raise any alarm. They seem like they're in league with the people down below who are robbing graves, but make no attempt to warn them or anything like that, and then eventually just disappear into the shadows. Very mysterious. Um, and this, the fact that there is somebody who so very clearly could ruin everything that Emily was planning to do, you know, taking on five dudes in a fight, <laughs> um, rattles her to the point where she's just like, you know what? Maybe this isn't such a good idea. And she decides that she's going to head back home and try to find out some more information about this through less dangerous, more official means. Which is a much safer option but unfortunately, doesn't satisfy her yearning for combat, which she's just going to have to live with. Um, it's going to be interesting to see Emily's growth over this story, if there is any. Which I say because this is basically what Emily is kind of like at the beginning of Darks Darksiders, Dishonored 2. Um, so it's kind of like this situation where it's kind of like when you watch a, or read or whatever, a prequel to something and, you know, you know what the character is going to be like in the thing that follows that story. So you have to kind of sort of implicitly realize that like, oh, yeah, um, by the end of this story, this character needs to be in this place kind of on an emotional character growth level. So like if they start off in if they start off the story in the same place that they're at in the story that follows, then there is a question of, well, what's going to change here? 
So, like, we're seeing Emily, you know, she's restless, um, she doesn't like being Empress, she would prefer to be out running across rooftops, fighting dudes, things like that. And that's really just where she's at at the beginning of Dishonored 2 anyway. So, it makes me, it makes a person, the person in this case being me, um, wonder what sort of growth could Emily potentially have over the course of this story... That would feel satisfying? Or is she going to maintain her current sort of like character development status quo for that entire time? Um, I would say I, an example of what I'm kind of talking about here is uh, the recent Dungeons and Dragons movie, Honor Among Thieves, uh, has two novels. Uh, that take place prior to the events of the film. Um, one of those is a novel called The Road to Neverwinter. Um, in it, we follow uh, the life of Edgen Darvis, who, as he meets Holga Kilgore, as he meets Forge Fitzwilliam, and as he meets Simon Omar. And we also follow the life of his daughter, Kira. Um... Now, what's interesting is that in the movie, in, like, the flashback kind of told at the beginning of the film, um, Edgen mentions that, like, oh yeah, we ended up taking Kira along on our heists, and she ended up being really helpful. Uh, up until, of course, the point where it's just like, oh, um, we're not going to take her on this one because, uh, you know, it is particularly dangerous. Um, and also the whole thing with, like, the Tablet of, Resur tablet of uh, Reawakening and all that. Um, but, you know, you have to... It's, it's one of those things where it's just, like, you look at where a character is at the beginning of this story and you ask yourself, okay, how does this character get here? So, when they start, like, their thievery in Road to Neverwinter, um, Edgen is pretty much entirely uh, bent on Kira never joining them. Ever. And doesn't really learn to trust her as a part of the crew until the end of the book. And that's how you get to like the start of um you know, the movie, Honor Among Thieves. Uh, so, like, you know, there's sort of a clear progression of the character in such a way that is still satisfying over the course of that narrative, but also leaves them in the spot that they need to start in to grow over the course of the main piece of work. Um... Something like this is a little bit easier to uh, manage for something like, you know, Halo, where in Halo 1, you don't really have Master Chief grow as a character over the course of the game, so you can use the books to give him character growth. Um, and I guess that's where I'm kind of getting a little, like, I, w I don't want to say I'm worried. I am, this book is written very well, and I'm really excited to read more of it. I am a little concerned with the fact that Emily Caldwin seems to start this book in the same sort of, like, character state that she is at the beginning of Dishonored 2. So the worry is... Is she going to actually have a character arc over the course of this book? Is there a reason that I'm going to want to keep coming back to Emily Caldwin? Or is she going to stay the same sort of like baseline personality for the whole thing so that she can then get her character development in Dishonored 2? In which case... Okay, if we do have that, then what other characters are going to be present that we can get some development out of? Because if it's just like a plot thing where it's just like, oh, here's like a cool plot for these characters to be thrown into prior to the events of the next game, 
Like, I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but, like, it is going to make it difficult to, like, really kind of care about the character growth if it becomes clear that there isn't going to be any, you know? So on that, let's launch into the next chapter, which is probably going to be our last chapter for the day. And uh, we will break until uh, the next time we reconvene for the book club. Chapter 3. Whoop. The New Mercantile District, Dunwall, 8th day, the month of darkness, 1851. Restrict the restless hands, which quickly becomes the workmates of the outsider. Unfettered by honest labor, they rush to sordid gain, vain pursuits, and deeds of violence. Of what value are the hands that steal and kill and destroy? The Third Stricture, excerpt from a work detailing one of the seven strictures. Corvo Atano slid into the deep shadow cast by the wide, fluted columns that formed the front of the balcony. He watched the rooftop on his right, waiting patiently as Emily Caldwin slowly crawled backward on her belly, disappearing out of sight. If all went as he hoped, she'd decided to be cautious and head back to Dunwall Tower. She'd done well. Corvo was the first to admit that fact. In the last few months, Emily had started exploring the city by night, sneaking out of Dunwall Tower to watch her citizens go about their business, watch as the city was rebuilt, restored, repaired. Every night, she'd pushed farther and farther out. Tonight was the first time she'd come so far north, crossing the old city wall and entering the new mercantile district. Good, he thought. This is all very, very good. No, better than that. She was superb as she put to practical use a decade and a half of training, their sessions hidden behind the tower walls. During her nocturnal outings, Corvo had followed her, keeping his presence a secret as he trailed the young empress, watching as she darted around rooftops with a speed and agility even he found impressive. The way Corvo saw it, he was obliged to follow her, two separate individual duties calling on him to keep her in sight to keep her safe. As royal protector, it was his official duty. The Empress sneaking out alone into the city at night would give the Imperial Court a fever fit. And as a father, he had another duty, one to keep his daughter safe while allowing Emily to stretch herself, to find out what she could and couldn't do, to explore the limits of her abilities, her ingenuity. She was safe enough, of course. He'd seen enough to prove that, yet he could never really relax while she was out. The tension of her being constantly alert, ready to step in, but hope the tension of being constantly alert, ready to step in, but hopefully never needing to, made the nights exhausting. He trained her well, though, even if he said so himself. There was no mistaking it. In Emily, he had the perfect pupil, willing not just to learn, but to be pushed. Nearly fifteen years they'd been training, fifteen years of study and practice in the subtle arts of stealth, of hand to hand combat, of protection and defense. They'd come a long, long way since the old days, when Jessamine was on the throne, when he and Emily, so young, had dueled with wooden sticks in those long, glorious Dunwall summers. How times change. And now the Empress had what she wanted, the skills and abilities she craved in the determination to cut her own path through history, not just as Empress, but as a defender, protector. Of that, Corvo couldn't have been more proud. As for the fact that Emily remained entirely unaware, oblivious to the fact that her protector was shadowing her, well, indeed, she was good, there was no denying it. It was just that he was better, a trained assassin with years more experience. Not to mention a certain set of skills that Emily could never dream he possessed. But tonight he had let himself be seen. Just a little, just enough. Not to scare her off, but to force her to take a more cautious approach. Except she had been scared off, which, in a way, was a shame, because Corvo wanted to see what she was capable of. There were five intruders down in the cemetery, and Corvo was sure she could have taken them all on in one, except... Except he wasn't quite so sure, was he? Or actually, no, scratch that. It was he who wasn't ready. Not yet. He was still royal protector, she was still the empress, and while she was clearly eager for action and adventure, an escape from what he could plainly see were the stuffy, occasionally suffocating duties of state, he wasn't ready to let her risk herself to that great a degree. Not quite yet. Pleased that Emily was out of the picture, Corvo returned his attention to the cemetery below. The porticoed balcony on which he hid was an extravagance, more like a platform from which official proclamations would be made, rather than just a cool place to sip hot tea in the afternoons when the square would have been full of life. He'd been up here before, several times in fact. This had been a small town, clinging to the side of Dunwall so closely, it was practically a part of it, despite the separation dictated by the cut of the city wall. 
It was a town, now a district, of merchants, rich old middle-class families, not really part of Dunwall's aristocratic society, and probably quite happy to stay independent, plying their trades and building their family fortunes up here just outside the walls. And then the Rat Plague had come. As in the city proper, the Rat Plague changed everything. The town had emptied, the houses here in the square and in the surrounding streets abandoned. What had become of the traders and their families, Corvo wasn't entirely sure. Most probably shipped out of Dunwall as soon as the Lord Regent had taken power, wary of his plans for the city's close, but separated neighbors. Good for them. One sec, drink of water. Doing so much reading can really dry out the throat. <clears throat> there are plenty of other, safer places to make a living, make a life. The merchants had gone, but their dead had remained. The Garden Cemetery, a place of quiet contemplation and remembrance, had been abandoned along with the houses, its deceased inhabitants oblivious to the slow creep of decay that surrounded their final resting place. The gang was working on the sixth grave now. The rain had settled into a mist-like drizzle, which did little to hide the sounds of their shovels and picks as they sliced into the damp, stony ground. Grave robbers. The thought sickened Corvo. Given the wealthy merchant families who once lived here, the private cemetery was likely rich pickings. Theft from the grave, from the dead, was desecration, a total disregard for the families, for relatives and lovers taken away too soon. This wasn't something he could let pass. Corvo readied himself. The task looked like an easy one, easier now as one of the thieves, apparently bored of the labor in the cemetery itself, wandered back to the covered wagon. He would be the first. All Corvo had to do was blink to the wagon behind the thief and strike. From there, the overgrown cemetery would provide plenty of cover, allowing him to reach the others without needing to call in his powers again. It would require just a few moments to take the rest of the gang out, all he hoped without a single shout that might attract Emily's attention as she scampered away over the rooftops. Corvo concentrated. He felt the familiar pins and needles sensation crawl over his left hand, on the back of which the mark of the outsider glowed with the electricity of the void. Corvo Focus picked his target, was ready to step swiftly across the impossible distance between his present location and the street when he ducked down, a tingle in his hand flashing into a hot, harsh burn as he was forced to release the gathering power. Hiding against the front of the balcony, he peered out behind, between the small sculpted pillars in front of him. The grave robber by the wagon, restless and bored, had moved into the moonlight and turned around, he was facing Corvo's direction. Corvo had caught himself just in time. If he had blinked then, the man would have seen him instantly. But there was something else. Something that made Corvo's pulse thud in his throat, his own breathing suddenly loud behind his mask. The grave robber was a whaler. There was no mistaking it. High black boots strapped with brown buckled leather, heavy black gloves with cuffs folded back at the elbow, a form-fitting coat, leather coat with characteristic short sleeves, the front crisscrossed with a wide belt from which hung pouches. At the hip, a long knife, the gloved hand hovering just a few inches from the handle. Over the head, a tight hood that shone damply in the moonlight and covering the face, the mask. Two large circular eyeglasses set in thick rubber. Below, the nose and mouth covered by a protruding cylindrical respirator designed to protect the wearer from the noxious fumes of a whale slaughterhouse. Corvo shrank down into the shadows, willing himself to vanish into the darkness, all the while the single thought running through his head. Whalers. Whalers. This man is a whaler. This man is a whaler. This man is a whaler. Could it be possible that they were back? Corvo racked his brain. The fortunes of the Dunwall Street Gangs had waxed and waned since the, day, since the fall of Hiram Burroughs, the Lord Regent. Some gangs had been taken down, worn away by a newly organized and reinvigorated City Watch. Word was that others had relocated wholesale and intact, trying to establish themselves elsewhere in the Empire, out on islands and in cities where things might be a little easier for them. Over the years, Corvo had even heard whispers that some of the Dunwall gangs, or members of them anyway, set up shop as far away as Karnaka, the capital city of the southern island of Circonos, Corvo's birthplace. Some gangs had vanished altogether, their membership evaporating. That included the Whalers, although the group hadn't just been any street gang. They were different. They were assassins. Highly effective, highly trained killers. They had a special gift granted them by their leader, Dowd, a man who, like Corvo, had been marked by the Outsider. The brand granting them both the ability to call in the power of the Void and wield the supernatural. Dowd. Assassin. Murderer. The man who had killed Jessamine forever changing the course of the Empire. Forever changing the course of Corvo's life. 
Jessamine had been his lover, Emily was their child. Doubt had destroyed it all, and it had taken all the willpower Corvo had been able to muster to not to kill not to kill the man outright. Instead, Doubt had been banished from the city on pain of death should he ever return. Fifteen long, long years ago. Fifteen years Corvo had spent wondering why he hadn't given in, hadn't killed Dowd when he'd had the chance. Perhaps he should have. Dowd's crime deserved it, but then perhaps there was a part of Corvo that wanted Dowd alive, living in fear of the royal protector's terrible wrath, should they ever cross paths again. Because perhaps living in fear was a fate worse than death. Perhaps. Afterward, Dowd's group had splintered. <coughs> Excuse me. One of his former aides, Thomas, had apparently taken control, at least for a time, until he too disappeared. Dead, most likely. Whatever became of the rest of the gang, nobody knew, despite the best efforts of Corvo and his ring of royal spies to try and track them down. Now, a decade and a half later, here he was, watching a group of whalers as they robbed a graveyard. Corvo peered again at one at the one by the wagon. Despite the clarity afforded by the lenses in his own mask, it was a little too dark to quite see the color of the whaler's tunic. As far as Corvo could tell, it looked gray. A novice. If they were all of that class, perhaps it wouldn't be so hard to take them all out. I gotta cough real quick. Alright. <clears throat> he shifted his attention to the others, watching as they worked in the weak yellow lamplight. They were hooded, yes, but... Corvo frowned. The others weren't wearing the respirators. Instead, they merely had their faces hidden by kerchiefs tied behind their heads. And while they were all hooded, their clothing wasn't a uniform as such. Which meant they weren't whalers. He raised himself up to get a better look, glancing cautiously over at the wagon. To his surprise, the whaler, the actual whaler, had gone. Corvo ducked around a pillar, careful to keep himself in the shadows as he cast his gaze around the square. The other men continued digging, oblivious to the fact that their leader had gone, but where? He had a good view of the wagon, and the whaler wasn't anywhere near it. He wasn't walking back toward the cemetery gates, either. There were plenty of other... There was plenty of cover beyond, but the space between the gates and the wagon was open and well lit by the moon. There was a sm There was a sound from behind Corvo. Infinitesimally small. A tick. A click. Metal on metal. The sound of a switchblade. Corvo spun around. Impossibly, the whaler had was standing behind him on the balcony, knife in one hand, the other outstretched fingers splayed. Now spotted, the assassin lost no time and darted forward, feinting to the left with the blade, then cutting right. Corvo jumped, curving his body away from the blade as it sliced through the air. Then he stepped forward, his hand already pulling the unique folding sword from his belt. With a flick of the wrist, the blade snapped open. Corvo brought it up, ready to parry the next attack. The next attack didn't come. Corvo lowered the sword, just a little, as he stared at the empty space in front of him. The whaler had gone again. Corvo turned, running on instinct, sword swinging. Behind him, the assassin moved easily out of reach before flipping their knife around, holding the blade parallel to his forearm, then lunging in for the attack. Adrenaline coursed through Corvo's veins. He took a half-step backward, then focused ahead, beyond his attacker. There, on the other side of the square, was a building with big black windows and heavy stone ledges. Corvo closed his eyes, felt a wind that didn't exist in his world, and opened his eyes again. He'd made it, just. He was hanging from the window ledge by his fingertips, his folding sword awkwardly gripping against the building's stone. He pulled up, lifting himself onto the narrow ledge, then turned, figuring out where he was, what his roots and his options might be. From the corner of his eye, he saw the assassin vanish from the big balcony in a swirl of black shadows caught in the moonlight. Corvo glanced down and blinked to a lower balcony located to his left, on another side of the square. Then he did it again. And again, and again, up to a rooftop, down to a wide copper gutter that creaked under the sudden materialization of his weight. Down again on the street now, behind the wagon, hidden from view of the cemetery robbers, then back up to the columned balcony from which he had started. He dove into the shadows in a forward roll, then spun, flattening himself against the cold stone by the archway that led inside the empty home. He crabbed toward it and slipped inside, the darkness there like a black liquid. His chest heaved with the effort. So many blinks in such a short space of time was draining, and the mark of the outsider throbbed on his hand. Corvo hadn't br brought any vials of Adermeyer's solution with him, the magical blue elixir that, according to its maker, the Dr. Alexandria Hypatia of the Adermeyer Institute in Karnaka, revitalized both the body and the mind. 
It was an improvement on the old health elixir developed by Sokolov and Piero's spiritual remedy, if only because the Adermeyer solution had the same restorative qualities as both of those potions combined. That meant, no, that meant less to carry, but if he was honest, he hadn't thought he'd ever need to use the stuff again. Perhaps it was time to rethink that. Keeping to the edge of the arch, he, of the arch, he peered around it, his strength slowly returning. He needed to rest, if he could. He was in luck. There was no sign of his pursuer, no movement. No swirling shadows on rooftops, on ledges, on in doorways. He had lost him. Moving back to the balcony, Corvo ducked down, near straining for any sound. There were voices now, from below, in the cemetery. Reaching the balcony edge, he peered again along the sm through the small columns and breathed a sigh of relief. The whaler stood in the middle of the cemetery, pointing with one hand the switchblade, pointing with one hand the switchblade and the other, still glinting in the moonlight. Around him, the robbers were starting to hurry, pulling the last coffin out of the ground and racing it over to the wagon, shoving it carelessly into the back of the, the, with the others. While they did that, the whaler remained where he was, looking around, knife ready. Carvo ducked down a little more as the whaler turned in his direction, but there was no indication that he had been seen again. One of the others called out. Corvo couldn't make out the words, but the meaning was clear. Confirming his suspicion, the whaler ran over to the wagon and finally, and finally putting the switchblade away, was helped into the back. At the front, one of the men mounted the seat and took up the reins. He gave him a flick and the wagon jerked into motion, the horse protesting as it was forced to speed away from the scene of the crime. The wheels rattled harshly on the cobbles. Corvo watched them go. He should have followed them. He wanted to follow them, but he couldn't. Not tonight. He'd worn himself out with the blink chase, and even if he got back to the tower to grab a supply of Adermeyer solution, it wouldn't be too close to dawn to head it would be too close to dawn to head back out. And besides, where would he go? Corpus sighed in frustration. Already a thousand thoughts raced in his mind. The whalers are back. They are active, they are planning something. Why else would they rob graves, craft carting coffins off to who knows where? More important than that, if the whalers were back, then so apparently was their leader. The man Corvo thought was gone forever. The way the whaler moved, transversing around the square to attack him, there was only one way to get power like that. There was only one man who was able to share it with the gang. Dowd. He was back, gathering his forces. But the assassin who had been supervising the operation at the cemetery who had attacked him, he wasn't Dowd. Corvo was sure of that. The assassin had been smaller, slimmer, the body language, the movements, they were different from what Corvo remembered. Then again, it had been a long time. Fifteen years. Memory had a way of playing tricks. Corvo stood. The cart was gone, the sound of the wheels and of the hooves of the horse slowly fading in the city. Then he glanced to the east, where, where already the sky was bruising orange and purple in a gap between the patchy rain clouds. Dawn approached, and with it, his duties to the Empress. He only hoped she had gotten back to Dunwall Tower and hadn't stuck around, perhaps witnessing the events of that night. Corvo headed back home, already running a plan through his mind. In the morning, he would send out his spies and begin the search. He would find Dowd, and he would discover what he was doing back in Dunwall. Oh, jeez. Okay, hold up. I just lost my place. I dropped the book! Ah! Let's just go ahead and turn this one down until we're done here. Maybe 10% will be fine? Alright, so... We have our first chapter featuring Corvo Atano, the main protagonist of the Dishonored series. I say main protagonist because in at least half the series, you can play as him. You play as him for the entirety of the first game, and he is one of two options for characters in the second. So technically, 1.5, let's say. Even though, realistically speaking, Emily is actually the canon main character of the second game. That makes me wonder, though, if it might not be a bad idea to do two playthroughs of Dishonored 2 uh, and do, like, an episode Corvo playthrough. That might be fun. Probably not as part of, like, the main series, but, like, maybe once I have, like, finished everything and just to, like, go back and, like, do it as a bit, you know? 
because I've never played through Dishonored 2 as Corvo. Might be fun. Yeah, no, turn that down. All right, so. So let's talk about Corvo Atano. So, in the first game, Corvo got the Mark of the Outsider, which allows him to use all manner of abilitoires. Abilitoires? Abilities? Abilities? Um... And we see him use the use at the very least blink uh, in this particular chapter, which I mean makes sense for him to use it. It's probably like the most like useful ability in his arsenal. Um, and uh, <laughs> I think I was reading that. And I was just like, oh, he's blinking too much in rapid succession. He's gonna need to. He's gonna. He's gonna need to have a Piero's solution, or sp a Piero's spiritual remedy. And wouldn't you know it? Um, what we actually get is we actually get the first mention of the Adermeyer solution, which is the. Uh, Man, essentially the mana potion from the second game. Um, and yeah, no, apparently that particular bit of game mechanic does, is still like in the book. Like they still acknowledge that like, yeah, using abilities given to you by the mark of the outsider is actually kind of uh draining on the spirit as it were um so i mean that's kind of funny it's kind of funny that they actually acknowledge that like yeah if he uses this a bunch he needs to drink he needs to like pop an energy drink he needs to pop a five hour energy in order to keep going uh with his abilities so that's kind of fun. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about this gang of people uh, that he found. So he was here the whole... So Corvo was there the whole time. Crovo? Who the fuck is Crovo? The person that Emily spied in the shadows at the end of the last chapter was Corvo. He let himself be seen deliberately to ideally force her to think a bit more cautiously, but seems to have overdone it because she ended up going back home. He feels a little bit bad about that, but he's so proud. He's so proud that she got as far as she did and that she's been doing all this. He has known that she's been doing this the entire time, though. <laughs> Like, she's good, he's better, is is kind of like the main thing that he gets at here. Um, and then, of course, once she's gone and he gets a closer look at uh, these gang members, he notices... One of these guys is a whaler. And Corvo's reaction to this seems a little panicked, um, which struck me as odd when I was reading it. Um, generally, I don't think of Corvo Atano as the kind of guy who panics, but at the same time, thinking back on it, it does kind of make sense. Hold on. Is 
surprised you can read yeah. the book while the baby's crying. I can barely hear the baby's crying. Moose is crying. Moose crying. He was in here earlier. Mitty hissed at him. That's fair. Like, this was the group that were responsible for Jessamine's death. Emily being kidnapped. And basically everything that happened after that during what was essentially the worst, like, like, half a year of Corvo's life. <laughs> the worst six months Corvo ever had. And these are the guys that were responsible for him. So I think we can probably uh, forgive him maybe being a little bit panicked at the sight of one of their number. Um, even if it is just a novice and he's able to avoid him pretty handily. Uh, that being said, uh, this novice whaler does appear to have uh, some frightening abilities that kind of put Corvo on the back foot a bit and cause him to kind of like you know, run a little hot, let's say. Um, including, as he describes it, the ability of transversal, which was only allowed or afforded to whalers when Dowd was in town. Like, 15 fucking years ago. So, Corvo, obviously, jumps to the maybe somewhat unreasonable conclusion... That doubt is back. Despite the fact that really the only um, evidence to this fact is that, oh, hey, this guy can teleport. As if there's nobody else in the history of forever that has ever had any sort of outsider abilities other than Corvo and Dowd. Which, you know... If the only people that we knew of in Dishonored 1 that were, like, marked by the Outsider were Corvo, Dowd, and Delilah in the DLC, who Corvo never met, that would be one thing. But Corvo definitely met Granny Rags, and he definitely knows that she was marked by the Outsider. So, you know, people who are marked by the Outsider are not exactly common, but, like, I, f I feel like, you know, they're... He knows that it's not necessarily that Dowd's back. But again, he is panicking because he's being reminded of the worst period of his entire fucking life. We also get a mention of the city of Karnaka in the um, country of Sirkonos. Uh, specifically of being um, Corvo's birthplace. Uh, Karnaka is going to be important because Karnaka and Sirkonos are going to be the location that most of Dishonored 2 is going to take place in, as you'll see. Uh, when we do eventually get to that game. Um, right now, nothing more than a mention, um, but uh, it's interesting to note that, you know, he's talking about how, like, there are gangs in Dunwall that basically relocated to Karnaka. Um, I don't think we see any of those gangs. I think most of the gangs that we see in Dishonored 2 are, like, more recent gangs, but it's possible that they formed out of, like, previous uh, organizations. Um, but yeah, with Corvo being aware that this whaler has abilities and uh, the rest of the gang seemingly not being whalers, this puts an interesting little bit of uh, intrigue in here. Because, like, with the Whalers, one of the things about the Whalers is that they were all gifted these abilities. So what is this Whaler with abilities working with these seemingly completely unrelated gang members 
who don't seem to share those powers. Who could say? We don't know for sure. But Corvo's, but Corvo's pretty, pretty sure it's Dowd. Even though, you know, we did just meet another character who uh, pretty clearly isn't Dowd, though does have abilities. And perhaps we will find out more about this character next time on the Shark Stream Book Club. I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody for coming by. I hope you all had a good time. I know I did. If you enjoyed this stream, you can subscribe here on Twitch. We have special emotes for subscribers. You can also follow me on Twitter, Tumblr, and co-host at AcidXShark. That's A-C-I-D-X-S-H-A-R-K, where I post all the streams as they happen. Or you can follow me on YouTube at AcidXShark, where I post all the streams after they happen. Art for the stream, VTuber was done by Audrey and B of Team Capel. You can find on Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube at Team Capel. That's T-E-A-M-C-A-T-P-L-E. -E. And the, um chalkboard background was done by my wife natalie who you can find on twitter at ghosty naps it's g-h-o-s-t-i-e-n-a-p-s um audrey and b take commissions uh you should commission them you should use their commission form don't email them they'll email you don't dm them if you dm them don't be weird don't be weird to my friends we'll make fun of you believe me we've done it before we'll do it again um and you should also check out natalie on Twitter because Natalie is the funniest person I know and I love her so much um, but yeah uh, upcoming streams uh, this evening we will be playing some more Deadly Premonition 2 so keep an eye out for that and then tomorrow we will be here bright and early or at least as bright and early as I can possibly manage for some prey the 2006 version, as part of the Sharkstream Shooterthon Overtime, which currently, we're three games away from finishing. We need to do Prey, we're gonna have to do Crisis, and then we gotta do our special playthrough of Duke Nukem Forever, uh, a game that was not released in the mid-aughts, but has that mid-aughts energy, you know? It's also bad. Oh, and I gotta do the one-chip challenge during it, even. Ugh, that's gonna be a fucking hassle and a half, let me tell ya. Uh, but just as a reminder, next week, uh, there will be no streams. Um, it's Natalie's birthday week, so we are going to be out and about most of the week, uh, doing stuff. Uh, my parents are going to be in town. Uh, so we will not be streaming next week, but we will be resuming all of this the following week. Everything. Breath of the Wild, uh, Dishonored, The Corroded Man, Final Fantasy XIV, Sinking City, Bayonetta 3, probably. Um, and then, of course, doing Crisis. Uh, anything else? Let me think. I want to say that's it. I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. I got some errands to run between this stream and the next one, but I'll see you next time on the shark stream. Same shark time, same shark channel. Take care, everybody. <laughs>